on your Jump, 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 jump What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party What's up, party people? In the place to be is Talib Kweli, the BKMC, the MCEO. You are now checking out another fantastic edition of the number one podcast on the planet, People's Party. Give it up for my lovely and talented and funny and thoughtful co-host, Jasmine Lee, in the place to be. Party people, give it up for Jasmine. Yeah, yeah. Woo-hoo, yeah. yeah Jasmine. Jasmine, yeah, word up. <laughs> Jasmine, how you feeling? I'm feeling good, man. Chilling like a villain. No doubt. We're going to keep this episode really, really West Coast. Today's guest is from Inglewood. Now, you out here in California. Yeah, man. You're spending some time. You know how ill Inglewood is. You know what I'm right saying? Um, I don't really watch reality TV that often. I don't feel like I'm the demographic is for. But there's a reality TV show on Netflix, mm-hmm. Rhythm and Flow, and it's starring Chance the Rapper. Cardi B. Cardi B. T.I. And they picked like the best rapper in this competition. And this reality TV show is right up my alley. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Today's guest is the winner of this show, Rhythm and Flow. Some people might describe him as an overnight sensation, but he's anything but that. They don't see the work that's put in. And this man has put in the work. He's been in the industry for a long time. He's repped the city for a long time. And now after winning Rhythm and Flow, he's going out the damn stratosphere. He got an album out right now. It's called Black Habits. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Englewood's own D Smoke. <laughs> Show. I appreciate you falling through. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, man, we got you some uh, toasting up. Cheers. Everything I need here. Uh, I didn't get the fatigue cheers, memo. Cheers. Oh, you can't. Cheers, cheers. T- to you. <laughs> the fatigue okay. memo. Army fatigue. We in a war out here, Jasmine. All right. You don't need no memo. Every day. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> yes, sir. D smoke. D smoke. Hey, what's up? Man, life, life, okay. all is well. Okay. Yes. I'm glad you came to do this with us. Yeah. Um, man, Inglewood. Who are the famous rappers from Inglewood? Oh, man. We or got famous it. artists in general. Famous artists. Uh, I'm going to go like out of order. I like Okay. That. We got Tyra Banks from Inglewood. Okay. Hey, Tyra. <laughs> you know, um, okay. He claimed that one first. Yeah, right. we got Tyra. Yeah. You know, as a kid coming up, I was like, oh my God, Tyra. Right, supermodel. We were it's all supermodel. rooting for you. Uh, of course, we got Mac 10 from Inglewood. That's right. Uh, we got we got uh, Big Y, the relatives from mm-hmm. Inglewood. We got, uh, it's just so many, um, Damani, you know what I'm saying? Damani. It's, it's on every level we got those artists. And then um, we got Woodworks. You know, Woodworks is my camp. That's your that crew. Came up. Yeah, you know, and Sir, mm-hmm. um, a lot of people don't know, Sir is a Woodworks representative, you know, um, who had the opportunity to, you know, collaborate with or build with TDE, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, the machine that built the Kendrick Lamar. That's you right. Know, the Ab Souls, the, you know, schoolboys, you know. So, right. Um, when that opportunity came along, it was different from previous ones. You mm-hmm. know, all our previous opportunities were, uh, you know, write songs for this person, get mm-hmm. in the studio with this person. Mm-hmm. You know, that was the first time it was like, hey, you, step up, step right. up to the plate. You know, so, um, but Woodworks is definitely the 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 Inglewood camp that the world is looking to see more of. Tell me more about that, because it's, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my understanding that y'all was really operating almost like a mom and pop Mm-hmm. Like out the crib, just getting the music out to the people on, on a real community based level. Absolutely, we was a uh, we was a mom and pop on so many levels. First, mm-hmm. at, at mom and pop's house, we okay, we worked out. <laughs> it was mom and pop, literally. Like, That's that real mom and pop. Right. Period. Mom and pop's house right. in the garage. Like my parents are are both supportive enough and crazy enough to let us build a studio, like convert their garage mm-hmm. into a studio, mm-hmm. and that's when things just started going ham. Like. And all of us start banging our records every week, and um, and so that was a mom and pop shop that got us the the, the situation where we were uh, signed to a publishing deal mm-hmm. and started writing for other artists. You know, somebody introduced, told uh, this guy about this guy named JC Jason Ricks mm-hmm. about us, and like, hey, my homies built a studio in the in the garage and they doing crazy records. He pulls up, we show him the pictures of us actually building a studio, like mm-hmm. drywall and right. you know, having an electrician come through. And more so than the music, that's what had him like, 
oh, these are these are a different set of kids. You yeah. Know? And so he immediately took us to those meetings and got us that deal. Um, I had a storefront on mm-hmm. Manchester and uh, Market Street called Woodworks Records. Mm-hmm. And uh, we literally were selling our merchandise, selling our music, you know, in solid form CDs. and Right. Some tangible to people hold tangible. hold on to. Exactly. Yeah. And people are now posting a lot of those T-shirts, hoodies that we were selling. Mm. And like, hey, I remember, you know. But we would literally get uh, 100 people inside and have mm. 300 people outside and had this sound system that is big enough to push a whole auditorium, but we just got it in a small room and banging out live shows. Right. And it was just something, um, something epic happened and the energy that we built at, you know, during that phase of our, you know, plight, um, was incredible. And that carries into what we're doing today. So. Right. That's really dope. It sounds a lot like Nipsey Hustle. Very much so. And Nipsey had to shop at the same time. We were, you know, what's crazy is I had to shop on Manchester uh and market. And uh, I was at the time I was still teaching mm-hmm. at View Park, uh, View Park uh, High School, okay. which is across the street. It's on Slauson and Crenshaw, mm-hmm. oh. across the street from Nipsey Shop. Right out. And even even like we did a show on campus one time, and I walked over to Nipsey Shop, and you know the homies who you know because I'm from Inglewood mm-hmm. teaching on Crenshaw and Slauson, the homies who were with me, <clears throat> who were supporting our movement. I was like, I'm going to just walk by myself because I'm going to go in there and do business. Ain't nobody going to sweat me if I'm spending money. Right. They still was like, I'm not letting you go by yourself, you know. So we would go over there like five deep. Then it becomes more of an ordeal because they in there like, we ain't seen none of y'all before. <laughs> right. You know, because Nipsey, man of the community, he hires his boys. Mm-hmm. So, but, you know, long story short, we do good business. They, you know, they see right. we about our stuff and they, you know, we dapped it up and was like, hey, man, y'all have a blessed one, y'all. Too. Right. You know, so, um, but it was very much similar to that operation. And I learned from that and was challenged by that even back in the day. Like, okay, I'm not the only one who sees it this way. Right. You know, authentic. Um, authenticity is a word that I think keeps coming up when people describe you and talk about you. Mm-hmm. Um, the judges on the show on Rhythm and Flow were very wary of gimmicks, yeah. Rubik's mm-hmm. Cubes and all that. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? You being authentic was, I think, the closest thing you had to a gimmick. Mm hmm. We can speak on that a little bit. That's interesting you put it that way. Um, because on a platform like that, authenticity is the standout factor. So I, right. I get what you're saying. Um, I think for me, it wasn't it wasn't even so much like me having to say, all right, go out there and be authentic. You know, mm-hmm. no, no authentic person says that. That's right. They just mm-hmm. let their guards down and let people accept what what comes naturally. Mm-hmm. Um, but on a platform like that, I think it's a little bit more of a challenge because you have to intentionally do it every time you step up to the plate Mm -hmm. because you're given instructions. You know what I'm saying? Because you see so many artists in one space. I think that was the most stressful part for me, like to show up and it's 32 artists all going over their raps and like people (laughs) pacing back and forth. And it's this energy that's like, I got to get it now. Niggas is hungry too. Hungry, you know, and it's not so much the hunger because hunger I respect and I can Mm -hmm. feed off of that, but it's just the eagerness, you know, Mm. to, to get it now, you know, because I got years in, in, you know, in my endeavors, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Whereas some people are a couple years in and they think like, I got to get it because this is a, it's an age race. Mm-hmm. Whereas I'm like, you know, our, our runway is long, you know, I got experience, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So, um, I think that was, that's what makes it harder to be authentic. When you got all this energy, you got to just focus and hone in and be like, what's uniquely me? Mm-hmm. You know, when you're in your own space, it comes natural, but when everything else is around, it's like, all right, I got to focus on just bringing me to the table. Right. Now, part of your story, you speak about your father being locked up mm-hmm. until you were about nine. Mm-hmm. And I've also heard you speak on how your life was different, very different before, very different after. Very much so. Could you talk to us about that? Oh, man. Um, so my life was both different before Pops came home mm-hmm. and after, and it was different. Even, and this is no exception to after he came home. It was different mm-hmm. in the house and outside the house, mm-hmm. right? So even before he came home in the house, it's love, it's music, it's food, family, you know what I'm saying? Outside the house, we had, even for my mom, who was a minister of music, we had specific instructions. Like they knew, you know, we weren't rich by any means. We're in this apartment building, you know, low income neighborhood. They're like, one, you don't let nobody mess with your brother mm. and you don't let nobody put their hands on you. Mm. Nobody. Right. So it's like we got all the love in the world, but it's like now nah, this is these are your instructions. These are your marching orders. Right. So before Pops came home, it was like fighting regularly. 
you know, mm. to the point where we enjoyed it. We brothers, you know, so we do it in the house right. as play outside the house. You know, it's it's fun. You know, my my uncle, who's uh, my uncle Rich, he's uh, six years older than me. So he's 12. His pops passed, you know, by the time I turned six. So mm. he's winging it, trying to be the big brother role model figure. But he literally put me up against everybody in the neighborhood. Like, y'all going to just get this out the way. Run all your fair ones. And then ain't nobody going to mess with you, mm. you know. And so that was the, the kind of like bipolar nature of growing up where we was at. And then coming in the house, it was literally like, all right, practice the piano. You right. know? <laughs> Pray before you go to right. bed. You know right. what I'm saying? Like, do your homework, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we shower up and, and you know, go through whatever our evening uh, duties were. But then when Pops came home, it was more so like, okay, y'all like fighting. Y'all like karate. Y'all like this. We're going to put you in a class for that. Mm. You know what I'm saying? You're still going to get that energy out. I'm still going to let y'all be boys, but we're going to put this structure around it, you know? And um, Pops, it's, it's crazy. Pops um, was more present than most fathers. Okay. And then you have like, you have people with money and influence and all this stuff. And sometimes they can't afford to be there with their kids. My dad couldn't afford to give me everything we wanted, but he was there. You feel me? Right. So... He would show up. He was baseball coach. He would he was chauffeur. You know, he yeah. wouldn't drive limo, so he'd take us everywhere. But then, um, but you know, so just having him there changed how we directed that energy. We was in the sports. We was in all that stuff. We still like when we got to Inglewood. It was a couple more fights, but it wasn't like an everyday thing. You know, it's interesting because you speak a lot about the family and your father. You know, like a lot of black men. Mm -hmm. was caught up in the system yeah. but also there's the dichotomy of he's caught up in the system but you also understand see him as a good father mm -hmm. um because a lot of our black men are caught up in the system because a lot of uh, in this generation and even our parents generation people are getting married this at the same rate right uh the stereotype is that you come from a place Englewood or a place that's mostly black you come from a broken family right and so we have families that are non-traditional Mm -hmm. families where people are going to jail families where okay they're not married but the father's still there for the kids right. you know I've seen polls where they say that black fathers on the average are there for their children and nowadays more than, than ever mm -hmm. the myth of the black fatherless home is 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 being shattered on an academic level but it's still a stereotype mm -hmm. can you talk to me about how important your family is to you and how that's led to your success because on paper, someone might look at your family and be like, that's a broken family. Mm -hmm. But clearly it's not. Right. And you you know what? It's it's families that on paper are the nucleal family, mm -hmm. mom, pops, kids mm -hmm. that are broken. That are mm -hmm. broken it's, up. It's homes. I've been in people's homes where they there, but they're not there. You right. know what I'm saying? They don't speak. They don't establish some type of like uh, norms that, that cause them to interact and show love and express mm -hmm. it in ways that kids need it. You know what I'm yeah. saying? What's unanimous in my experience, because, you know, I, I taught, like, kids need love. Mm -hmm. yeah. They need that connection. You know what I'm saying? And not, like, always, like, lovey-dovey, pamper them kind of thing, but just that connectedness on yeah. a consistent basis, you know? So, in so many ways, yeah, every family is broken. You know what I'm saying? Even the ones that have both parents and a, and a roof over their head. Um, but the the key, I think, for me was having people that would take the time and, and invest. Like when when we said something was important to us, we had the parents that would figure out how to get what we needed to continue doing that. Like when it was we was on karate tough, like trophies, sparring, you know, regional championships. <laughs> I'm just thinking about what Cardi B said in the show. She said, yo, this nigga do everything. He probably do karate. I laugh. And, stuff too. I laugh. And, he, and he do do karate. Right. I laugh, bro. And, and both my brothers. You right. know what I'm saying? Sir, sir was the only one that didn't go home with a trophy. Mm -hmm. on it. But, that's, but no, look, let me explain why. <laughs> it was because he knocked the kid out. You know what I'm saying? It was like. He was disqualified. He was disqualified. He was like yeah. in a, with the, the Cobra Cobra Khan, Cobra uh, is it something. <laughs> that he fucking was, karate kid shit. Oh. Advanced. Sweep the leg, nigga. Sweep the leg. <laughs> but so yeah, man, it um but they were the type of parents that would invest in what we took passionately. Like mm -hmm. if we were in karate, they bought us karate bags mm -hmm. full of karate gear, the kicking bag, the we had nunchucks with the pad on it so we could beat each other with oh, them and right. stuff like and um and that goes for everything. Like and if it wasn't my parents, it was somebody else in the family, and that's the extended community around it like uh my uncle andrew he uh 
he literally one year and and what's funny is Terrace Martin grew up uh, around us like my uncle Andrew yeah. did these jam sessions. Terrace, what's up, man? What's up, Terrace? What's up, Terrace? You're you supposed big, to be, be here already. He remembers my uncle telling him like, I think I'm gonna get these niggas my whole studio, mm. Mm. and he literally packed up all his stuff that like from the keyboards to the every cable used to connect it, and my parents cleared out of space. And it dropped off his whole studio at our house, and I was in eighth grade. Mm. You know, now he saying? played bass for Prince. Played bass for Prince. Played for Shaka for years. He was Prince's last bass player. Yeah, so yeah. I, I had to have met him. Yeah, Andrew, I was Bouchard. around for a lot of them last few Prince shows. Yeah, and he played. He played on a grip of Warren G stuff. Like okay. him and Warren G played with Snoop. He actually played with Destiny's Child. Like he, you know, Andrew Goucher, He's a legend to us. You know, and, right. And so you you work. On your on your new album, you got your family all on the album. I do. I do. Um, your mother, you is a minister of music. She sang with Anita Baker and Tina Turner and Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. Mm-hmm. You tell the story on the show of her. She had an opportunity to sing for Stevie Wonder, but she turned it down because she had to stay home and raise the babies. It's true. But she taught you how to play piano mm-hmm. at six years old. Mm-hmm. How important was that to your development, not just as an artist but as a human being? Oh man, it's it's. I still can't kind of quantify what that all of what that meant. Like, um, one, it's a pastime, mm-hmm. you know. So many kids forget the value of having something to do mm-hmm. day in, day out. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not gonna get good without. They, uh, some people tell me like you should practice six hours a day. I'm like six. I don't have six hours. Mm-hmm. I can you this three that I got. <laughs> right, you know right, what I'm right. saying? But you know, and that's why I like community centers are so big, like pastime. So just to keep the young mind occupied in a productive way, that's huge. Um, but yeah. also to like a lot of people start with piano and give it up. And that's because um, they don't have that person who does it close to them. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, or the way it's taught is so much like a structured way and not like here, let me show you something. Let me just yeah, share yeah, this yeah. With you, you know? So, and I think that's the same thing with language. Like, we learn English long before we go to an English class. That's right. You know? Nobody's a, saying, this is a verb, this is a noun. It's, it's people, a practical thing. Practical thing, yeah. right? And I think music is the same way. Like, here, let me just that's show interesting. you interesting. I never thought, I never thought it about is. it like that, but that's exactly right. How important is piano playing to your current status as a rapper? Uh, it's super important. You know what? It's the one thing that I knew I wanted to do before I got off Rhythm and Flow. Mm-hmm. And it just so happens that no round presented the opportunity for me to do that. Um, but I think I think that's a beautiful trend mm-hmm. that can start in rap music. One, I think so many rappers, and I don't think you one of them, forget the influence that they have. So you're, everything you do is an advertisement for mm-hmm. somebody younger. Everything. And and I, sometimes I do it frivolously. I put on something and I was like, eh, whatever. I wore a soccer jersey the other day. And so many people was like, oh, you like this player? And I was like, oh, sorry about that. Right. <laughs> that happens you know. to me because I like baseball hats, but I don't follow sports. Oh, my God. So I, th- I throw on a Bills hat and forget about it. They'd be like, he's Bills Mafia. I'm like, I don't know what that is. Uh, right. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> like, I just like this hat. It matches my coat. Exactly. And people will run up on you if they're the real fans. Yeah. You know? So, um, but everything you do is an advertisement mm-hmm. for, for a kid or You're something, right. you know. So to play instruments, it's like, if a kid says, like, I want to play an instrument, then they find out how much time that actually takes to do it. Then you got somebody that's like, no, I, I'm over here with it because right. in order to become what I see myself as, I got to do that. So um, I think it's just a, a, a cool, like Anderson is doing that and it's it's incredible to watch. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because it's pushing the boundaries on what artistry is. Yeah. You know, so. On Rhythm and Flow, when uh, Chance the Rapper said that he didn't know that you played piano, was that like 100% true? Or did he like have some kind of hint that you were going to do it? You know, I think it was true because um, they didn't share uh, they didn't share our like other moments with the judges. Mm. Like and I asked him later, like, how did you not know? Because I've been I have been playing every time I go in the studio. Mm-hmm. But then it's not like they're reviewing the footage and stuff. They're literally because they're doing all kind of other stuff in between. They're right. showing up once a week and we're filming all week. Yeah. You know, once a week, the competition time comes, you know. And so, you know, for the people who are filming and, you know, the producers, they knew every session. I'm like, I need to be in the piano room, you know, because right. there's only one room in certain studios with the piano in it. And I'm the only one that play out of the contestants. Well, no, that's not true. You know, Sam plays some and other people like mm-hmm. play a little bit. But I'm like, for me, it's therapy. So I'm like, I need to 
dip off mm-hmm. for right a good hour you know so the one thing is i think um i think tip did mention it though mm-hmm. because it was on my little card in round one but you know it's like a little resume so right forget they may, yeah exactly but when you're seeing it it's something different yeah because when i saw it i was like he's been playing the piano this whole time right. like we had you not know but that makes sense yeah they were in the studio with us enough you've been working on this music thing from before the show this is mm-hmm. you um did you produce records for Genuine Pussycat Dolls? Uh, wrote for I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> I did right. So uh, one of my mentors was uh, Brian Michael Cox. Okay, like, good when dude. We were writing songs, excellent dude. Great musician, incredible musician, yeah. and writer and producer. Yeah, all that. And um, so he before before he even had a reason. It's all kind of writers that would have written with him, mm-hmm. but he. He literally was like, I want to work with Woodworks. Like, mm-hmm. flew us out to Atlanta and worked. We did a uh, we did a record called Frozen Over for uh, for Genuine. Um, Pussycat Dogs, we did the record Taking Over the World okay. that Chase and Cash produced. And then um, I did a song, I wrote and produced um, a song called Never for Jaheem. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Jaheem. And it did really well. Among other artists, you know, like Lloyd, uh, Joe. It was funny because mm-hmm. I was a young wow. kid writing these very mature records you know right and when in a time where they was telling us like we need a single for beyonce we need a single for rihanna and usher Mm -hmm. you know that's all they was telling us at the time you know i'm like man i'm just writing songs Mm -hmm. and some of my team was like we need to pitch these because this one is gonna is what they want Mm -hmm. now and those weren't landing because it's like oh you know they chose to go with the tricky and the dream record but for some reason the song that i was just like hey we're just writing this one right they would be like I need that song. You know what I'm saying? Right. And then it would be, and, and it's not like top of pop charts, but it's like doing extremely well in its category. So it was just an interesting thing. And I think it still lends to like, when you just do mm-hmm. what you there to do, you know, something happens. You know? Yeah. You, um, with the show, you're, you're still working on a, on an amateur level with mm-hmm. your music, your teaching and everything, but you have, this family structure where you can look and, and see success, whether it's your brother or what your mother did before. And then you've had your own success in the business. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you're not as phased by the trappings of the industry right. as some of the other contestants. I noticed a lot of the contestants, like I said, a lot of people was hungry. Mm-hmm. And not, not to say that you wasn't hungry, but there's a lot of people who came in a show that I was noticing had never been on a plane before, yeah. never mm-hmm. been in a studio before, mm-hmm. never even thought on the level, just like, I just, it's just this raw, pure, unfiltered talent. Do you feel like your experience gave you a unique perspective and maybe a unique leg up on the competition? Absolutely. I think, um, my goal was different. Mm-hmm. I didn't go there to win. Keep mm-hmm. it 100. Like, I did not go on rhythm and flow. Like, I'm going to win this. Right. I, I need to win this for my family. Mm-hmm. Nope. I went to represent. Mm-hmm. And I was like, and represent means a very specific thing. Winning means I got to do what it takes. Represent means I got to do these certain things, mm-hmm. which is, you know, like, if I'm representing, I'm representing Inglewood. Like, I felt like I won already. I've like the show doesn't make me successful. Mm. I was successful. I was a successful teacher. You know what I'm saying? I was good at it. Once you're good at teaching, you, you, everything is really impactful. You know what I'm saying? So, um, I can't go from being a, a, a real one in, in the city, a real teacher, respected to doing some funny shit. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You touched on two primary philosophies that I live my life by just now. The first one is, one of them is old, older, and one of them is more recent. First one is you have to people have to change their definition of success. Mm. You know, success is you do what you love for a living, mm-hmm. and you have valleys and peaks. You have up days, and you have you know down days. You have days when you're making money and days when you're not. Yep. But as long as you're doing what you love for a living, that's success. Mm-hmm. And people think that success is having all the toys. And that's not because people have all the toys, but be miserable. Mm -hmm. People have all the toys, but be getting caught being pedos. You know what I'm saying? Like you see what Mm -hmm. happens with these billionaires out here. Mm -hmm. Like they be out here miserable. You know what I'm saying? Jay-Z got all the toys and he still want to work for the NFL because that drive to have everything is still making him go out there and get it. Mm -hmm. Most deaf, I was with him the other day. He was making a joke. He said, if I was Jay-Z, I'd be learning Kung Fu or, you know, (laughs) learning ancient languages. He's like, why is he out here still working? You got it. it. If we're calling it 
material things, right. you know what I'm saying, or, or a certain degree of wealth. But no, so I, 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 I like agree. the fact that you that you say I'm as successful as a teacher mm-hmm. because you're not looking at success the same way that everybody who's running this rat race is. Period. And the second one, which I've come to more recently in this Trump era, has helped crystallize this for me. <sighs> the idea of winning may be, and this is a controversial idea, about to say. <laughs> and maybe a white supremacist construct. Mm. You know what I'm saying? With all due respect to DJ Khaled and <laughs> T Pain. <laughs> right, 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 right. Because sometimes all you all you do is win, Damn. and sometimes that's what you have to do. Right, right. With all due respect to them, the idea that we have to win mm. and that's what the purpose of life is, that may not be what it is. Because when you win, people are losing. Yeah. And we all in it together. You're stepping and on it's, people. And it's misleading. Yeah. It's misleading. That's why you have people who get there and look around and it's like, this is it. Mm-hmm. You know right. what I'm saying? Like wherever they right. They is. give you a they give you a, a token or they give you a a medal, a piece of shiny thing mm-hmm. that you just like, okay, you won. Here's a here's a blue ribbon. Pap's blue ribbon. You ever heard of that beer? Yes. Them motherfuckers <laughs> won that blue ribbon, what, in 1930? <laughs> they still <laughs> call it Pap's Blue Ribbon. <laughs> You're not the winner no more, nigga. It's probably a better beer than then since then. Yeah, automatic. You know what I'm yeah. saying? But they still they should say Pap's Blue Ribbon because the concept of winning. You know, like we we've been brainwashed and indoctrinated to chase that clout and chase that cheese and chase that that win and compete with each other mm-hmm. when you should only be competing with you. Period. Mm-hmm. That's it. Period. Yeah. It's the same way when it, when you look at relationships and marriage and things like that, because everyone's like, oh, I have to get married. I have to do this. If I find somebody, I'm going to be happy. And it's like, you really have to find self-happiness because if you're not happy by yourself, you're not going to be happy with a partner. You're not going to be happy with a number one single. Right. You're not going to be happy with a million dollars. You're just chasing right. right. And even those relationships become competition. You, you're you trying to win someone's affection mm-hmm. and then you're trying to control them like, nah, this is my person. Mm-hmm. I, this is my person. And mm-hmm. right. who, who are these other people you talk to? Let me look at you, your phone and right. see who you're talking to. You and then it, sometimes it's just so that you can exist more comfortably in those circles where that's the norm. You know yeah, what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, As it relates to relationships, you know, so. On the song Free. Yes. Talk about your father. Mm-hmm. But you talk from the perspective of of your friend who you lost to cancer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, take us through that. The third verse. Yes. Okay. So, um, my my musical journey is is interesting. I started off playing piano, then mm-hmm. producing and writing, and then I started off rapping. I'm like a late bloomer in rap, mm-hmm. right? I had a homie named Chiz, rest in peace. Chiz came from a family of rappers. Mm -hmm. His brothers were both in the streets, heavy, and rapping, you know. And they had a crew called Bones. And, um, you know, they actually ran with, you know, uh, I want to say Lazy Bone before they moved out there and started Bone Thugs and Harmony. Okay. His brother started all of that. And then, um, so... I ran with him. We started a group called Park Circle after we both, you know, I graduated from UCLA. You know, he he left Cal State Northridge and mm-hmm. uh, we started Park Circle. And that was on the heels of getting those publishing deals and writing for other people. That was the first thing we said, like, if we get behind our own music, we could create a movement. And we yeah. ain't going to have to ask nobody for nothing, mm-hmm. you know, because we had written songs for people that did really well and they didn't come back to us. Mm-hmm. So we was like. You know, that's not what it looks like. Right. It's not what it's, this is not winning. You know what I'm saying? For whatever it is. And so me and him linked up. It was really on the marketing side because we we did stuff really intentionally, even as youngsters. On the marketing side, it was like we from Inglewood, but we playing the kind of outcast, tag your man, switch up, have crazy hooks, different beats and show up and really say something. You know what I'm saying? But have the hooks, you know, down the line enough to where people remember the song and they're like, hey, I fuck with this. You know Right. And so we did a whole project called uh, The Colors of My City. You know, Inglewood embraced it. You know, we started putting together events. All of our family and stuff would show up and invite everybody. And um, and so from then, you know, we started a, another project um, called uh, Black Gold. Um, at the time, I got a big check from... Uh, from never you know never played on the radio for a long time his album went gold Mm -hmm. you know and i had production credit and writer's credit so when i got that check i was like let's do something different black gold let's go out the country we shot a video 
in Brazil, in Bahia, the place with the That's most where black people is at. Most black people yes. outside of Africa. That's right. More black people in Brazil than there are in the States. Yes. You know, so um we went there, shot the video, and this at that time, I didn't know what the time frame was because, you know, we got faith, we pushing. I'm like, I know you in treatment, I know this and that. Like he had been through rounds of chemo by that point. Mm -hmm. And not only chemo, he had a, a stem cell transplant. With his brother. His brother is like, man, I'm showing up for you. Take my sales. Mm. You know? Um, and so he was he was literally fighting on will. Just pure willpower. Like, I'm still doing music. You know what I'm saying? And then um, we did the project. Um, did, shot a video out there. Casey Veggie's featured on the song. Okay. We shot his part in Inglewood. And, um, and then months later, you know, he ended up passing. You know what I'm saying? And so when we're telling that story, it's like... Uh, you know, what if I was to need some medicine for my lymph nodes? I'm a pimp with these hoes. My bitch gave me a kiss and my neck was swole. I was in the studio next to smoke and a big homie BJ, BJ said, boy, get that checked out. You know, guillotine flow. Don't stick your neck out. Nigga, I'm cheers. I spit that best out. So when I'm when I'm speaking from his perspective, one, I'm like, man, I got to rap. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Because cheers taught me how to rap. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Anybody in the city of Inglewood who knows how we got down knows I was doing beats. I was writing hooks and I could put together a song in a way that make people like, oh, this is a winning song. If mm -hmm. that's if there's a such thing, you know, but Chiz was like rap is different. Rap is a whole nother type of songwriting mm -hmm. because it's not just it, it's it's it Chiz taught me, like, listen to rap that you don't necessarily like mm -hmm. but because he's like. People connect to it. Mm -hmm. That's the first order of business. Like kind of like what we were saying outside. Yeah. Write it so people connect to it. Because I'm used to being like, people like it. He's like, but liking it and connecting is two very different things. That's right. You know what I'm saying? So he, um, he literally, I would literally be like, how's this verse? And sometimes he'd be like, hey, that's, that's dope. You did uh -huh. it. You know uh -huh. what I'm saying? Right. Other times he'd be like, yeah, go back in because I don't know what you're doing. You need right that. There. That's you a good friend. A good one. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? I got plenty of people around me that'll say no. And I invite, even in my team now, I invite disagreements. Mm -hmm. You know, not arguments because right. once you're arguing, you're so committed to your point that you're not listening. Mm -hmm. But disagreeing, we could be like, okay, well, Please explain, because I right. might not be understanding. It's my favorite word, explain. Please, yes. Yeah. Please yes. explain, expound on yes. what this idea I'm confused. Explain it to I me. Must be. Yeah, <laughs> you know it must be. It must be me. <laughs> I must be, because we on different pages, right. and I trust you. Right, so right. So I must, we, we we don't get it, you know, so, um, but I, I literally would ask for feedback. Yes. And over the course of those projects, I could see my verses growing, you know, and then, you know, then I did a project called... Uh, 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 what was that called? Oh, oh, um, uh, higher learning. Mm -hmm. You know, and I only I didn't even upload that one. That was only yeah. solid. This is a lot of work. You know what I'm saying? It's a lot so, of work to yeah. get to where you at. Yeah, yeah, man. Rest in peace, to Cheers. Rest in R.I.P. Cheers, and the city know who he is. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So, yeah. not a people's party know who he is. Period. Uh, um, so Englewood. Let's talk a little bit about Englewood. Yeah. Um, Englewood. It was a Native American community that settled in Englewood before L.A. Right, and they still use natural springs there, right? Mm -hmm. And then there was a had the KKK there heavy in the 1930s, and then you know uh, they call LA Little Alabama, you know, because there was this movement from up south and people moved the migration from south and black people mm -hmm. coming up, and you had this great migration specifically to Inglewood, right? Mm -hmm. um, that was in the 60s, but then in the 1990s, Latinx, right, mm -hmm. population, Community, yeah. Increase 134%. That's a rich, diverse cultural stew in history. How does that inform you as a man and as an artist? Um, a lot. You know, I, I got a chance to, if not witness, be connected to people who witness these different phases. Mm -hmm. My grandmother moved in Inglewood in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So she moved in before all of the white people who were there originally moved mm -hmm. out. You know, and um, so... She bought the house that I grew up in. She bought it when it cost seventy thousand dollars. Wow! And right now it's worth eight hundred fifty thousand yeah. dollars. And you know we not in it, but it's like we watched those phases happen. And then um, Inglewood for my brother Ron Ron, who you know he banged and and all that stuff. Because when pops was locked up, I was you know two to eight or nine. 
he was 13 to 20. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Which is a whole different set of years for Pops to be gone for him. But Ron Ron, he was there when it was primarily black and when the Latino community, Latino, Latina, Latinx Mm -hmm. community was coming in, um, there was this tension at first. Like, what is this? You know, because the natural thing is, okay, if you're the outsider, um, you got to assert yourself in a sense because the people who are already there are going to be like, wait, hold on, this is ours, mm. you know. Um, and, and in L.A. in particular, <coughs> of course, everything is instigated by L.A. County Jail and how the yeah. divisions are perpetuated there. You and know that comes back out in the community. Exactly. Mm. Oh, it, ble- it, it fuels it, you know what I'm saying? Because people come in and out of L.A. County Jail. My brother told me, he was like, bro, prison is like a home. Mm. L.A. County Jail is like the projects. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Once, And not that prison is any less... Uh, I mean, dangerous or whatnot, but LA County Jail is just like on steroids because co- people coming in and out of the streets. Some are on their way to yeah. court, you know. So mm-hmm. that's how you know a society is really systemically oppressed and broken down mm-hmm. when the rules of the incarcerated become the rules of the street. Period. Um, but my brother, he lived in that time in the 90s where it was like it was intense mm-hmm. race, uh, you know, even wars, I would say, you know, w- wars have battles. You know, mm-hmm. it's, a war can extend over time. So you might have some peaceful days, but then some days it hits the fan. You know what I'm saying? Um, and then my era was a little bit after that. It wasn't as intense because at that point it's about half and half. Like literally the rule at Inglewood High is like if you're running for homecoming prince, if you're running for ASB, you know, if you're running against a Latino, you just probably won't win because <laughs> right. it was 55% Latino, 45% black. We mm-hmm. almost had half and half, but they got, a, right. you know, but the thing was, um, you know, like I ran for president. I won president at Inglewood. You know what I'm saying? Um, but the the Latino community, it was, it was super supportive of black people when it was like, when it was like, oh, you cool. You know what I'm saying? What what people, what's always perpetuated is like the gang's beef and the people chill. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but it, it, in the same way that the, that the county jail bleeds into the streets, the gangs bleed into the general population. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So. And that's where you get the affiliations and all that. Exactly. And I'm affiliated. No right. exception. You, you grow know? up there, you have to be to a certain degree. Period. And, and the, the interesting thing is, I was telling somebody, it plays to your advantage too. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it, in a sense gangs begin to serve their purpose their original purpose mm-hmm. when you come to affiliation and I gotta be in a city every day well, yeah, which so is safe passage survival right? mode everybody's yeah. surviving on codes and exactly so, yeah so it was plenty of times where my brother actually being from an uh, Inglewood gang you know kept me out of or, or my cousin so many people that I know it's like knowing somebody was like oh he good mm-hmm. right you know what I'm saying and we yeah. needed that yeah you, we, we walking we on foot every day you know, right until we not until you not and <laughs> in LA if you on foot you just dealing with the wolves you the dealing with it mm-hmm. yeah you aware and my nephew now he's doing it you know what I'm saying yeah but, so it's a different time though um with the term uh, Latinx uh, mm-hmm. I didn't say that right did I you did okay I I've written it a lot but I don't actually get to say it mm-hmm. I don't find myself in conversations where I'm even saying it a lot mm-hmm. I notice when I'm reading about you that term is used often mm-hmm. is that term are you uh, involved in making sure that people use that term? Um, no. Okay. I'm not involved in making sure. I, I, I'm not one to Because I know that I see it more often yeah. with you than I've seen it with other people. Yeah, I'm not one to, I'm not one to police how people refer to other people. Right. Um, there are certain ones that are obvious, so to go against that rule, like to somebody that's not black being like, nigga, you know, mm-hmm. that's like, it almost feels intentional, so I will be like, hey, look, right. man, I'd appreciate it if you didn't. Right. You know, and I, I'm also like, Everybody, I give people grace to make a mistake once. Mm-hmm. I give you, you know, benefit of the doubt. You don't know. But if you do it again, and I'm like, I now have to assume it's offensive. Mm-hmm. Right. right? Um, but for Latino, Latinx, um, Latino, Latina, Latinx, um, I'm, not, I'm not one to police people because I believe that forward motion requires everybody. Mm-hmm. And if progress demands that everybody speak a certain lingo, you know, I, I get that terminology is helpful, but break, if it, can, and can you break down that term for people who don't know? Okay. Latinx, basically, um, Latin, Latin culture is everything has a gender. The table has a de- gender, right? La mesa, the cup, el vaso, 
right? And a lot of times they're very arbitrary, but when you're using the language, it has a gender. Um, now, as we're talking, we're becoming more progressive as it relates to gender. Um, you know, we're challenging where this comes from and how it perpetuates mm -hmm. roles and stereotypes in society, right? And in doing so, without necessarily assigning people to specific genders that they don't identify with, you're like, okay, we're just going to say Latinx. We're going to leave it as a variable for you to decide where you fit in, right? right? And I get it. Um, and I support you know, however, I I believe that progress and movements should leave room for people who live day to day lives. That's right. Right. It shouldn't. Uh, a movement is never for only the most elite educated people. That's right. You know what I'm saying? So there there has to be a culture of understanding to people who are just oblivious to that because they work a a nine to five That's right. and have done so for 15 years. You know, if you're an alien to that whole movement, but you have a good heart, you should be able to contribute and participate. And so a lot of times we create these triggers where it's like, you didn't say the right word. You're not an ally. Like, mm -hmm. hold right. on. This is a, this is a person who takes care of the kids. You know what I'm right. saying? Well, you well. know, so, um, so I never police people for using the wrong terminology. I got Latin homies who, and, and this ain't a popular, uh, viewpoint but i got latin homies who around me they say nigga mm -hmm. i mean you know i'm from I'm new york so I, most of my latin homies say nigga exactly yeah and the, i'm the reason i'm not mad at that because when i went to ucla i had black homies who grew up not in the hood at all mm -hmm. who's like nigga and they they would just every new black term <laughs> they would just throw it around so much and it's like <laughs> right man if you was on crenshaw and manchester you wouldn't survive because right. they would call you out on not really knowing what you're saying like, whereas a Latino who grew up in my neighborhood who, who walked the same streets as I did, they might be like... Dealt with the same police the brutality. Same every Treated like a nigga. Period. Just like, yeah. Period. So that's not... I'm, I'm, I'm saying this on camera on everything. That's not popular. Because oh, yeah. the academic community want to be like, if you're not black, don't say it. Jasmine feel the same. I you know do feel the we've same had this, We've had this discussion on this show. Multiple times. But as you said... It you take you you I do give people room to say it once and it's like okay please don't say that around right. me and, and then if you continue to that. say it yeah. then it's a problem if you say it because like a lot of times people from different races they get passes from their black homeboys and they don't realize that those passes only go with your friendship group that's yeah. not for a universal pass yeah. and 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 that's caring about it. <laughs> like look let me explain something to you. I don't, mm -hmm. I'm not a part of that group that gave you that pass. Mm -hmm. So chill around me. Right. And at least that tells him like, oh, shoot, she's giving me the benefit of the doubt of explaining this. Mm -hmm. Somebody ain't. But I'm glad we're having this conversation with you because you're a very unique individual. You speak Spanish mm -hmm. and you've leaned into it and it's a big become a part of your wheelhouse and your repertoire mm -hmm. in terms of not just you were Spanish teacher in yeah. school and you rap in Spanish. Yeah. Afro Latino is a thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I think the confusion comes because where I grew up in New York, you have, you know, Latino people who look just black like us, Dominicans, Panamanians, people from Guyana, you know, people from, you know, all over, people from, from hey. Colombia sometimes. It could yeah. be wherever. There's always, in Cuba, Puerto Rico, there's always a, a, a dark-skinned black community in these places. But then you have the ones that look light and or look more white or look more Hispanic or whatever. Mm -hmm. And in New York, and it's different in the West Coast, in New York, if you identify with Afro-Latino culture or Afro-Latinx Latinx culture, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what your complexion is. If you identify with that culture, you live that life, you saying nigga. Yeah. If you big pun, you saying nigga. You yeah, fat yeah, Joe, yeah. you saying nigga. Period. He look light skin, yeah. but he 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 would if you ask him, he got a he got in a, a, a problem. He went on Breakfast Club and said, I identify as Afro Latino. And that's different though. When you, you know? if you're saying I identify as Afro But people got mad at him. Because they like, now nah, you look you look white to me. Be real. Be oh, real man. mother. Be real said his mother is an Afro-Latino, Latina, Cuban woman. Mm -hmm. He said, my mother looks black. But you, I, a lot, and be real, he wore his Afro when he first came. But people still didn't see him, especially him being from L.A. Mm -hmm. When he said, nigga, he said on this show, he said he stopped saying it. Mm -hmm. Because he realized it was too triggering for people. He said, I grew up saying it, but as I became older, I stopped saying it. Right. But you... I just want to know how you got it. Because do you have like Latino roots in your family? No. This is just something you you chose. Period. Yep. To lean into. Sp speak to me about that. Um, 
I went to, well, my my family moved around a lot, mm -hmm. right? So I went to a grip of schools. Mm -hmm. The one school that I went went to for the entirety of that like whole phase, like elementary, middle school, high school, mm -hmm. was Inglewood High. Right. That's the only. That's why I'm Inglewood High repping, wearing the green and white. Like every other school, I went to like five different elementaries, mm -hmm. nearly a different elementary every grade, middle school, three at least. But um, my last couple years of elementary and my first couple years of middle school, I uh, went to L.A. Christian School. It was predominantly uh, Latino. And so that was the first time my friends that I see every day in, day out are code switching all the, all right. the time. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, man, I got to do homework, pero no tengo la, un lapis, no, no tengo espacio porque hay muchas personas en la casa. No, you know, no, no me puedo enfocar. No, ¿Cómo voy a hacerlo? And I'm like... Wait, hold on, bro. Like, I don't have paper is what you said, right? Exactly. I don't, even, I don't have space to do it. There's too many people oh, in the house. Kidding. You know what I'm right. saying? Like, it's like, um, hay demasiadas personas. That, you know, it's like people at that age, they don't know their code switching sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like, I'll go back and forth. And, and if they wanted to, like, focus, then they'd be like, okay, I'm going to stay in Spanish. Like, how do you say that word? But and to be comfortable, they would go back and forth. And these are my friends, my good friends, you know, you know, Irvin, Erica, Carlos, the people that I grew mm -hmm. up with. And um, I went to their house and their parents fed me and all this stuff. And so that was my first immersion experience. You know what I'm saying? I was just the oddball out. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was that early that I was like, oh, I'm going to learn it. Yeah. I was just that kind of kid. I think because Pops was out, it was it was like I, I took on like grown man qualities as a kid seven years old is the first time i remember looking around in the world and being like oh this is my world mm. you know what i'm saying that's because pops was gone you know then when pops came home a little bit of that reversed like mm. all right, right we gotta we gotta deal with him <laughs> right, right pops wasn't no joke you know what right. i'm saying but when he wasn't around i still kind of because i had been introduced to that part of myself i still was like okay whatever i want i'm gonna get it you know what I'm saying? And so Spanish was one of those things. And it didn't, it wasn't until I went to Inglewood High, took Spanish one, two, three, went to college, you know, ended up majoring in Spanish literature and studying in another country that I like mastered it. Mm, okay. And a lot of the, the misconception is, oh, you learned it in class. It's like class gave me the tools mm -hmm. to learn it in the streets. Like yeah. I, I picked it up in class, but you don't you don't got it till you get out there. You know That's what I'm right. saying? Like so. I, I took Spanish 101 and Spanish early in junior high school and high school. I took it for a couple of years, and then I spent a lot of time in Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic. And you know, I spent a, a couple months at a time there, and I found myself having conversations in Spanish. But just because I learned the conjugations mm -hmm. and learned all the little words and the meanings, and they it just started making sense once I put it into practice. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You also can learn from watching telenovelas on Netflix. Period. What? <laughs> what do you mean? That's the you gotta learn it by watching telenovelas. You know what I'm saying? Like it's the, the classes give you the tools. Mm -hmm. But then you still got to build a house. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, I I, I was doing immersion mm -hmm. in L.A. Yeah. And that's the that's what people don't realize. You have the option to be like, all right, I'm 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 in Spanish L.A. right now. Right. You know what I'm saying? L.A. is one big Spanish class. Come on, man. Yeah. Everybody your teacher. So Wouldn't that's what it be L.A. without the Mexicans? Not at all. Listen, <laughs> they work everywhere. And like, as a, working in kitchens, if you work in a kitchen, you have to know certain Spanish terms or mm -hmm. you won't be able to survive because a lot of them, they really do not speak English. I mean, it's not just kitchens. It's like, you know, in everywhere. America everywhere. Yeah. You know, I was I just came from L.A., and I had several interesting questions and several interesting conversations with my uh, Postmates drivers <laughs> right. in Miami because they, what? I mean, they, they oh, you're in Miami. Oh, I was in Miami sure. and they date the Postmates drivers and all that and 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 Lyft. It's like there's a culture out there. Was like, yeah, they don't have to learn it. Right, they don't you have know, to learn English. I'm gonna go ahead and challenge both of y'all, right? Mm -hmm. Because what happened, I I kind of noticed, and this is an American thing, so it's no, you know, y'all not unique in that. Here we see so many because the culture is there's a pride in work. What you were talking about, what success is, you look at families. There's this documentary called Happy. People who work and enjoy their family are tend to be more happy, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's a pride in work in the Latin community that causes people to be comfortable with jobs that we we just turn our nose on, mm -hmm. right? So, but in America, we we tend to be like, okay, they do these kind of jobs and relegate the latin community to that whereas studying abroad when you start to be like oh there are doctors lawyers professors who do not speak english mm -hmm. who are some of the most respected intellectual people you would meet that you're like okay 
this is a world like Spanish is not a world that requires English and it's not a, it's not a working world either. It's a world in and of its of itself. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's what challenged me to like, OK, hold on. I, I need to really dive into this yeah. because it's not just what, you know, America's the only country where people don't speak multiple languages. That's right. How do you um? how long? Because I know like when you're in Spanish class, you learn the correct way to do everything. But that doesn't always work in the street. How is that taking your what you learned in the classroom and switching it over so you can talk to natives without, you know, them looking at you like you're crazy? Man, you know what? I'm still learning. It, that's an ongoing process in the same sense that somebody could make a rap song like I, I put out no commas. Mm -hmm. If somebody just referred to no commas right now, you'd be like, what, what do you mean by no comma? Mm -hmm. Right. Spanish language is living and moving. Yeah. So it's like if you're not tapped into the community, the next day somebody could be saying stuff and you're like, what is that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Words flip and bounce meanings and all that all the time. And yeah. you know that mm -hmm. as well as anybody. So like on Instagram, I, I follow some people and. I'm getting 80 percent, 70 sometimes of what they saying, mm -hmm. because once they get to some place like uh, there was one dude I was watching on Instagram and he was like, Tamo activo, tamo activo. And it's like Estam in my class, it'll be estamos activos. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. active. You know what I'm saying? But you're not going to be like estamos activos. You're right. going to be like tamo activo. <laughs> right, you're right, take right. All the S's out. You know what I'm right. saying? Like. So it's it's living and moving, and I'm still doing that work to this day. Like no doubt, to this day, to this day. Oh, I like it. <laughs> to this day. Shout out to Deontay Wilder. No I don't doubt, give a fuck with y'all. No about. doubt, you came, you had uh, he, he he had you out there with him, didn't mm -hmm. he? Hey man, much love oh, to yeah, him. Seen the yeah. Much love to him for giving me that opportunity. It's it's like my I'm man Radio Raheem is the dude. He said to this day too. Yeah, <laughs> that's the homie. <laughs> right here. Right here. Right here. That's the homie. You, you know, know, you know it's crazy. I was sitting, I was having a fucking dinner with this dude, and I mentioned the shit. I, and I was on I was on some meme shit. He was like, yo, you know that's me, right? I was like, that's you. <laughs> I looked, I'm like, oh, this he said your name. He did. I hey, wasn't even right yo. <laughs> Cause you just see the to this day part. Right, right. Yo. That's it went viral. Yo. Um, so your music. And your personality is super pro-black, super conscious. Absolutely. Which I appreciate that about Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Um, Make no mistake. But you also have this hustler, hustler spirit, this work ethic that's normally stereotypically associated with like a drug dealer turned rapper. Mm -hmm. How do you make the pro-blackness work in a business that frowns upon it? Because I have my ideas of how I do it for me. But my way of obviously don't work for everybody. I've been right. in this business for a long time. I've never compromised on my pro-blackness. And it worked for you. I figured out a way. Yes. But I know that my way don't work for everybody. Period. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, but I think I think that just makes you a visionary. It's mm -hmm. your way. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I think that's what uh people are recognizing and respecting about me. Like, it's my way. Whatever yeah. that like what I observed, I observed I had the privilege of like moving with winners, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? And I'm just observing the process. I don't think I don't think success is a result of of like any one lucky opportunity. It's a result of building in a strategic way. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, I structured myself to succeed in those ways. And and just when you when you have a very specific um a very specific way you want to succeed. Like when, when you're like, I'm not going to compromise mm -hmm. my pro blackness, then it may extend the runway, which is another piece of advice. When I tell people, you know, when they're like, Oh, what's your secret? What do you do? Extend a runway for yourself. Mm -hmm. Be like, give yourself a whole lot more time than you're going to need. Yeah. And act as if you can get it in a year and then just keep going. It's good advice. You know, um, I, I may, I may extend the runway, but, um, it's a matter of it's a matter of continuing with that plan and building in a way where you like where you can withstand those like you know the opposition you get opposition for being pro black mm -hmm. yeah you get you, you know people I was telling people like I get a lot of comparisons to uh, Kendrick yeah right one I have the utmost respect for Kendrick Kendrick's degree of artistry Kendrick is right. brilliant as you should you know what I'm saying anybody who don't mess with what Kendrick is doing that's I right. kind of question like where are you coming from and that's family at you know this point because your brother works exactly yeah. you know what I'm saying and we're from a very very similar communities have similar influences mm -hmm. and I think that's kind of what people when you're selective on what you listen to when you have a certain degree of like 
uh, understanding of self, you don't just let, do you listen to everything out? I used to. I don't anymore though. Okay, it's impossible. Yeah. It's right. So many songs. But no, I, I used to try to ch challenge myself, but there's 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 limitations right. to that challenge. Right. Let me rephrase yeah. it, because you might check out everything out. Yeah. Do you live with everything out? Oh, absolutely not. That, that, I don't invite it into every space. Exactly. Yeah. So and I, and I do the same, right? Yeah. I will give everything a shot to be like, right. okay, I've heard it, I've lived with it, boom, boom, boom. Right. But there's I like to things, say I I pay attention to the trends, but I don't follow them. Period. Yeah. Right. There's certain things I'm comfortable letting my guard down and listening to over and over that's right right and that's a, a limited bunch of artists right and so um when you have the type of person who's like that the influences start narrowing down yeah right so in the sense that if it was trap if it was if it was turn up shit if it, if i was another little with dye hair and painting my nails and not to knock them at all they're Somehow they they get away with doing very similar things and not being compared. Mm. Whereas when it's like, okay, he's talking point. about something and he picking he picking beats that got more music in them now. You know, mm -hmm. you know, it's not somehow it's winning, but it's not radio. So then they gonna immediately compare. That's right. You know, so, so that's that's just some and and I think that's something that every artist who stands out will deal with on their way in. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Until people begin to see like, oh shoot. This is he's his own person. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I think I think we're at that point now because we're still only months. We haven't made a year past the show. Yeah, I mean you're still brand new. No. Yeah, I mean no. I you know we don't this this table has seen a lot of legends at this table. Yes, it has. You know we we had um, Ice Cube here recently. I saw that, yes. You know this morning we had Everlast from House of Pain, West Coast OG. Mm -hmm. And so when bringing you onto the show, I mean like you heard the intro. I didn't start out watching the show. I got I caught on to it late, but I like having you at this table because it's not about amount of followers, it's not about amount of years, it's about how authentic you are to the craft. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, from what I seen in the show, and then when I went and listened to the records, Black Habits, Anglewood High, I'm like, nah, this is a this is a conversation that I would like to have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, now after you went to UCLA, right, mm -hmm. and Absolutely. then you went started teaching at Anglewood High. Inglewood first, yeah. And then your album is Inglewood High. Yes. It's a tri it's obviously a tribute to your time there. Mm -hmm. Um what has teaching meant to your music? How has teaching informed your art? You know what? Teaching is it's like the lifeblood of creating. Like, um, I tell stories that aren't my own mm -hmm. from an authentic standpoint because you're so close to this to the to the the walk that the the young people are walking you know and I'm young myself but I'm saying like kids you know and um teaching the, the beauty of it is there's a certain inherent degree of for lack of a better word consciousness mm -hmm. and when I say consciousness not in the sense that it's like I'm preaching anything but it's just awareness mm -hmm. of what's happening around when you're when you're in the classroom, mm -hmm. when you're in the classroom doing what you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Like if you're in the classroom and you closed off to the students, like you hand them papers, you don't know what's going on because they don't fuck with you. Right. And you ain't really there to fuck with them. You're just collecting a check. Mm -hmm. But if you're in the classroom doing what you're supposed to do, it's an, it's a fair exchange. You know what I'm saying? And, and so when I was there, you know, I would start off with my life stories before I ever said open a book. And then I would ask them to tell me what's up before I ever gave them an, a different assignment. And, you know, so they, we established that norm of this is an exchange at all times. Right, this is the homie. Y'all not a blank slate. Right. You know what I'm saying? I'm not a buster. So, <laughs> right, right, right. You know, I'm going to learn from you. You're not going to run over me like you do the other ones. Because mm -hmm. this is Inglewood High. Don't get it fucked up. They they in there sending teachers home crying. Mm -hmm. And and so it's like, look, you going to get respect every time you come here, even if I got to reprimand you. Unless you like completely disrespecting me, I'll pull you to the side to do it. I'm not here to embarrass you. Mm. But if you put me on blast, I'm going to do the same to you right on the spot. Did you plan to work at Inglewood High or did you just end up there? The the principal recruited me. I had a good ass job. Keep it 100. <laughs> I, was a, I was a director of an outreach program based out of UCLA. I got four sites. I got multiple grants that I'm managing. I got, you know what I'm saying? Eight coordinators that I hired and, and 
28 other staff members. So it's a full project with an office at UCLA's campus. And but I go out to the community and to them, I'm the extension of the students. So they're like, you still a student right. to me. Right. I'm like, no, I graduated and I'm a director. Right, right. You know? <laughs> right. But so but I'm the in third time. In period. The, the, the principal's like, well, you want a real job. Come over here. Right. So the only thing is that director position uh, for the shape program. Shout out to shape because it's, mm-hmm. it's, they doing necessary work you know what i'm saying filling the gap between like Mm -hmm. the teachers and the students but you know that program the director uh, position was a two-year term Mm -hmm. so it's like they want some new blood every two years so i'm like all right when it's done let's go right at inglewood high you know so i was recruited which is like most opportunities right um both my parents are teachers dope my brother's a teacher his wife's a teacher um common's mom's a teacher oh Kanye West mom, rest in peace. Don DeWest was a teacher. Um, rap teachers. Uh, Defarai was a teacher. Bun B. Um, J Live. Sadat X. E. Knife Wonder. D Smoke. D Smoke. You know what I'm saying? This is a great oh, club to be in. That's an amazing The club rap to be in. teacher crew. Wow. Um, what unique issues do teachers of color face dealing with marginalized communities? Teachers of color are are not primarily there to teach they're there to alter paradigms mm. losing we are still gonna go with winning and losing mm-hmm. if there is a such thing losing paradigms misled um uh, misinformed toxic paradigms that are just super common in the hood mm-hmm. right you know, and it's usually paradigms that the students have about themselves. Mm. You're not limited to that. That's your biggest challenge, like getting them to see themselves differently. Mm-hmm. And so how you structure stuff is so that you create all these opportunities for small wins. Mm. And then when you see the small wins with the students being like, did you see that happen? Mm. That can happen in it, anywhere you want it to happen. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I think in other communities, kids know they got it. Oh, my parent got this. I can I can make mistakes all year and right. still win. The right. kids kids in the hood think mistakes are fatal. You I got to get them to believe that mistakes are good. Mm. Make that mistake. That's how you get there. Right. You know. So it's it's the paradigms that you're working up with, the ways of viewing the world. Like I, half the time, I'm going in like quoting seven habits of highly effective people, so we can just shift how they view the world, mm-hmm. so that they're better. You know what I'm saying? It's not so much like, uh, it's not so much like, let me teach you Spanish. Because mm. the first the first opposition you get don't have nothing to do with Spanish. It got to do with them. Mm. Right. And they don't even know it. They think they hate Spanish. Mm. I don't want to learn that because they mean, just a poor man language. Right. It's just going to make all the excuses in the world. But really, it's like, I don't believe in myself enough because I haven't been given the the vocabulary to talk myself through anything. You know? And Word. by vocabulary, I mean like, perspectives like Word. this too shall pass Word. learning learning Ooh. just little all kind of quotes and i would i would leave with quotes like quote a quote a day to where they like restructure how they view everything you know so that's the biggest challenge and some teachers aren't equipped with that because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. they know their subject they don't know perspectives they because right. it's something that they did passively for me, I had to do it actively. Right. Because I'm up against Inglewood. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I can't passively just assume I will be successful. My parents instilled it like, these are your, and most of that was, for me, it was biblical. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Then then in college, it was like, okay, I got that, the benefit of that. Now I got to abandon the the hardships of growing up yeah. with, the, with the religious, so to speak, uh, upbringing. You know, so now, then you find that balance where it's like, okay, the, the faith element is real. These restrictions are imposed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. So <laughs> it's interesting. Word up. Going back a little bit to our conversation before, on Rhythm and Flow, you rap, these little niggas call me Mr. Harris. Fair. Ferris. Fair. Oh, yes. shit. <laughs> Come on now, man. I'm sorry. Them little niggas call him Mr. Ferris. These little Ferris. niggas call you Mr. Ferris. <laughs> you know what? It's, it's, it's television. I, but I didn't let you finish. What was your name? Oh, I was going to say, as a teacher, is your stance on the word different? towards your students than it is when you're rapping? You know what? I let the students create their norms. Like, mm-hmm. I wouldn't tell a Latino student, like, don't say nigga. But if the, if the black students wasn't having it, because in L.A., they're still... L.A. is becoming more like New York now. Mm-hmm. But 
mind you, I've been teaching for some time. You know what I mean? Um, the I think it was a, it was still a time where where black students was like, you can't say that in here. And my my main thing was respect other people. You know what I'm saying? So if it's like he's not comfortable with that, then, you know, it's easier for you to adjust for the than for him to change that mindset. You know what I'm saying? So, um, but but yeah, I, I like to have a collective, collectively negotiated environment where it's like if he's not cool with it, man, you might not want to say it because if you right. end up fighting, I'm not breaking it up. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> so, I'm not. I made the mistake once. Uh, breaking up a student fight, it was two girls. Oh no! Oh man, this girl socked me get... in my face. Oh god! <laughs> Took one. Bing. Oh. And what were you about to say before I asked the question? Uh, that shit was... Oh, oh, oh! I was gonna say there were at that rank, at that time in that in the competition there was still thirty two comp thirty two contestants. It was mm-hmm. a cipher round, and it was like several rounds with four people each round. So understanding what the the necessity of packing it into one one episode, they didn't play the entire verse, uh. you know. Um, so I wanted to share the, the lines before. It's like, I love my, uh, uh, I love good music. I love to share it. I love my students. Them little niggas call me Mr. Ferris. So it, those two lines before right. weren't even there. It was just like some, some, some. Th- I, I mean, my that, students, they call me Mr. Ferris. That, like, <laughs> that line hit home for me because, you know, I wrote an essay called Nigga Please mm-hmm. about the N-word, about why people say it and why I've said it in my music. And, and my mother don't like hearing me say it. Yeah. And my mother's an educator and I come from educators. And you being an educator and to see you on that TV being like, them little niggas call me Mr. Ferris. I'm like, that's that's my world. That's that's the hypocrisy and the di- dichotomy of yes. the contradictions of my world. And that's the challenge of artistry. Mm-hmm. Artists have to sometimes intentionally and other times just like by nature of right. going with what your first thought is, break the rules. Right. Mm-hmm. And, so- and teachers have to do the same thing because otherwise you lose them. Right. Because they think you're, they know that one from from their standpoint it's impossible to get everything right right so if you're this model of what it means to get it all right then they're like oh you're not real to me right but the minute you break the right rule to break and then pull them right back into oh now this is how you navigate it then they're like oh you got them hooked right. so it's like in that one line it's like them little niggas called me mr ferris like it was that's just like <laughs> reflective <laughs> of some of my like, sit downs with them right like when the door closed or or we step outside and then the rest of the class is inside mm-hmm. and I got to level with you because you disrupted everything. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to be like, please, sir, you're just really causing a right. problem. You gonna talk like, nigga, what's wrong with you, bro? Right. Like right. if you was my, I would really tell, tell students, like if you was my little bro, I would put hands on you. <laughs> and they'd be looking like, no, you wouldn't. But right. Not, you might not say that because you look, right. I believe you kind of because, because to them, they also have those big brothers that would put hands on them. Mm-hmm. So to them, in, in in other communities, they might not interpret that as love. Right. I understand that somebody like being willing to touch you mm-hmm. reminds you that you tangible. Like, nigga, you here mm-hmm. with me. You know what I'm saying? That's it's like, love. It's like when your mom, because when you was playing. Life is real. It's got boundaries. When you was getting ready for the la- when the last episode, when you had to create the, the song that you, you won the competition with. Mm-hmm. And you playing piano with your mom. She's like, you want to curse? She'd be like, yeah, I'm going yeah. <laughs> yeah, to curse. I'm cursing. Mom. I'm cursing. That's what we do. You, you want me to curse on this one? Yeah, that's you what you do. Mom, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, one of the realest moments I've ever seen on television. Mm. Much less that TV show. You know what you're talking about. You already know where I'm going with Snoop. This. Yep. What you mean? That was one of the realest Snoop. moments. And this is what's real about it. Is that Snoop was communicating with you, and I, I, you know, well, Snoop was communicating with you in a language that is unique to Los Angeles, yep. and he was pressuring, pressuring you, and he was testing you, and you knew it, and he knew it, and people who knew what, but y'all didn't explain it. Mm-hmm. Nope. The show didn't take time to explain it. So on this show. I would like you to take time to explain in that moment what was happening and what you was thinking when Snoop was like, but where are you from now? All right, let me start off by saying, I know I'm not explaining this for you. Okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> We're going to explain it for, right. the, for the, the cameras. People. That's right. You, because you, you know what that was. I know you, exactly yeah. what One, that was. Let's, let's start by saying Snoop didn't ask everybody that. Mm-hmm. He asked you when you he said you were from me. Inglewood. He asked, what I think, I think before I said I was from Inglewood, I think he already wanted to ask. Right. 
And I think it speaks to the energy. And again, to use your word, the authenticity behind Mm -hmm. what I presented Mm -hmm. in my art, in my performance. Right. So Snoop, uh, he didn't ask anybody else, which means he was moved in a different way, Mm -hmm. which means in his world, he's familiar with that energy coming from that place. It's like that question I asked you about the pro-blackness. That you move in a way where people would think, oh, this is just a street nigga. Mm-hmm. Period. And they're not, they not seeing all the other stuff that comes with you. Absolutely. Yeah. And and so um, I think I'm an intersection of all that shit in the mm-hmm. same box. Like church, mm-hmm. street, uh, music, art. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Fighting. You know, mm-hmm. so. But I think Snoop saw that. And I think it was a line. I didn't mean to look at Snoop. <laughs> I said, I, I, I didn't mean to look at Snoop, but I think I looked at him when I was like, if you don't like it, then fight me. Go meet the hill of my Nikes. You know what right. I'm saying? And and so I think part of it could have been like, okay, he, 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 up there, he got that energy. Right. And he said that. He I don't did know you like that, this too. He didn't. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that, that part made the cut, mm-hmm. but um, he said, you got, I could tell you got that energy. Yeah, he said, and that's a yeah. The way he, he said. set it up, he had already paid me the compliments before, and mm-hmm. I think people forget that mm-hmm. he had said, obviously, what you're doing is diverse, mm-hmm. it's real, it's I love what you're doing, but let me ask you something, right? So the the setup is already like, despite how you feel about how I'm pressing you, you know, you know, it's like I see what you're doing and I mm-hmm. respect it. Let's just get this little formality out the right. way, right? You know what I'm saying? And that's a LA thing. And it's not, and I'm not foreign to it. And and the thing about it is the reason I could stand up and without budging being like I'm from Inglewood is because there were real life threatening moments where that was the case. This was not life threatening. This is television. This is television. Mm-hmm. And not that and and but Snoop got that energy where it's like cameras didn't disappear now. That's the OG. It's two, <laughs> it's two men in the room. Yeah. That, and that's the magic of being somebody like the legend that is Snoop Dogg. Me and Snoop shot a video yesterday. Snoop has this 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 way of erasing the extra and bringing everybody home. And for in that moment, home was L.A. In the video, Snoop is in the middle of Inglewood, the biggest crip in the game, showing love and the blood's coming out. Man, Uncle Snoop, Uncle you know what Snoop. I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? The bloods who told us, like, you're not going to have no problem on this block today. Mm-hmm. You know, they walking up to Snoop, like, and he giving them game, chopping it up. Some nephew. Snoop brought the, the taco truck out uh. and told no, and told everybody, don't pull out no money. This is good already. Everything they got in there is y'all's. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So that's just the the duty is. And, and, and I didn't, I knew when he was asking that it wasn't, it wasn't me impressing me. It was more like, Go ahead, tell him what's up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And 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 so it was just. I think it would. I agree with you. I haven't seen no moment like that on television. Yeah. Not especially unscripted. Mm-hmm. We yeah. create them and and we put them together sometimes brilliantly, like straight out of Compton is scripted. Yeah. But then they did such a good go- job of casting to where it's like, yeah, you don't lose none of that authentic energy. That's right. But unscripted. Nothing has like happened like that unscripted. Yeah. And and I appreciate that because everybody knows that it's like, you know, I, I even paused for a second to decide how I was gonna answer. I see I see all that. You can I see all that. Because I could have been like, Well, my brother from here mm. and I grew up right over here and they got my back. But it's like you asked me the same question, so you're gonna get the same answer. And that's man shit to me. Like, I'm not switching unless you switch. If you say, Okay. What block though? Manchester and Fifth Ave. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Park Circle. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Who who you know? All the bros over here. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? But he didn't switch the question, so I didn't switch the answer. And then his immediate response was, respect, cuz. Huh? You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, you stood your ground. And it's been that ever since. Because somebody at his level, you got to test that part of a man before you decide to fool with him. Ever since, I can't say I have any bigger ally in the game. That's Snoop. That's Snoop. So is your heart like beating out of your chest when that happened or you were just like chilling? I was chilling. chilling. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Because first off, I finished my performance. So the Mm -hmm. hard part is out the way. My thing is, it's so much going on. The nerves that did kick in, and I'll be honest, the nerves that kicked in happened because it's like, 
This is fresh material to a beat that I didn't choose. And it's a lot going on. This is not my crowd. This is a television set. So the nerves have more to do with don't forget your words, Smoke. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's all fresh material. And so once that's out the way, I'm like, we chilling. Right. I got this from here. Got it. Got it good. You know good. what I'm saying? Yeah. Got it until the next challenge. That's right. So I, my heart wasn't beating out of my chest in that moment. That's why we smiled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He knew He knew there was more to it. And we've had extensive conversations mm -hmm. since then. He knew there was more to it too. That's why I didn't even say, I don't bang. It's so much I could have said. You just said, I'm from Inglewood. I'm it. from Inglewood. Right. You fill in the blanks. There's a question, there's an answer. You fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. and And I promise you, the, the love has been ridiculous. You know what I'm saying? Shout and, out to and, Snoop, man. Uh, a name well learned, Uncle Snoop. And he's been Uncle Snoop to more than me. That's right. You to me you? too. To me too. Come Snoop on. has jumped on records for me. Snoop, with the, but the blast blew up in LA because Snoop was had a show on the beat and it was playing the blast. You know what I'm saying? Like Snoop has, Snoop got, had me on BET with him freestyle. Like Snoop has been, had created 10 poles in my career. He do it for everybody. For everybody. I'm, I'm an underground rapper from Brooklyn. It don't matter. It's the same shit with Snoop. Same it's shit. It's hard. But Word up. Yeah, that's uh, a real moment. <laughs> um, on the show, I liked seeing Chance, Cardi, and T.I. because to me, it changed a little bit as it, as it went on. But to mm -hmm. me, it was like Chance was, Chance was the art guy. Mm -hmm. Chance was the like, I'm the here for the craft and the art. Cardi, especially when she started out, was because all she knew was how to sell. Yes. So her whole shit was like, wh what are the white men who sell this shit going to say? What's their opinion? And can you please them? Mm -hmm. T.I. being a stellar artist, an icon, but also a stellar businessman was a mix of the two. Mm -hmm. Where he's like, I'm trying to do good business. And a reputable. Right, reputable. That's the one, yeah, yeah. yeah. Rep I'm saying rep you got a stellar artist, stellar businessman, and in the middle, you got this reputable hood figure. A hood figure yes. that's that's tested. Yes, exactly. And and passed the test and Every respected on the streets, on the street level as well. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing to me about the show was watching Cardi, who all of us, I think, to, to a certain degree of fans of Cardi B. Whether you're a fan B. of her music, a fan of her antics, a fan of her shenanigans, you just are somehow a fan, right? Of her grind. <laughs> of her, her grind, her yeah, story, her come up. Yep. Her come up. Mm -hmm. What's interesting to me is that Cardi, more than anybody on the show, for me, and this is just my perspective as an outsider, because I've never met the young lady before. Mm -hmm. um, I met her once, actually, but that was at a nightclub. Um, <laughs> you know, and you know how that actually go. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know how that actually go. Um, she she didn't approach she she comes from the background where she was tripping in the clubs and loving hip hop and the social media mm -hmm. it's not the same artistic grind mm -hmm. it's a grind but it ain't the same grind right. so I found myself thoroughly entertained by Cardi thoroughly by the voices and the the little jokes and the little fly little shit she say mm -hmm. but completely disagreeing with everything that came out of her mouth mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying like that's terrible advice. Why is she saying that? <laughs> no, that's not right. No. But by the end of the show, mm -hmm. that changed a little bit. Right. And I feel like I watched Cardi grow as a person from someone who only knew how to sell, who came into it like, okay, I got to pick a rapper. Well, I'm going to pick the one who has the best chance for making me money right. or making somebody money. To Because of artists like you and to be fair to all the other artists who worked hard and grinded yes. and she saw the grind of the art shit I felt like I was watching not just y'all grow, but I was watching Cardi in particular grow. Interesting. Do you agree with that? Um, in a lot of ways, yes. Mm -hmm. Reason being, Cardi admittedly was the was the only judge who was most sad to see that process come to an end. She mm -hmm. was crying and all that. Yes. And and when the cameras went off, she was still like, ah. Oh. She was moved. She, yeah. Because she connected with us. She did. You know, um, I would say that. Because I see a lot more than y'all see. Mm -hmm. Early on, I recognized like, oh, shoot, it's way more to her than people get to see. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I like to tell people there's no accidents. You know, you don't, you're not going to get to the top level of it. You might have a look and it'd be gone, but there's no, there's no rising to the top and maintain that by accident. Right. So, and Cardi's no exception. It's intention, it's grind, it's thought. You know, and even if it's comedy, even if it's, you know, the witty remarks, 
she has her own unique timing to all mm-hmm. of that stuff. And then the off camera moments where, you know, for example, me and old man Saxon. When that we was battled, my next question, bro. That's what I want to talk I'm gonna about say next. Two things. I'm going to say two things. Understanding that they have to edit a show and limit certain time. Yeah. My intro was eight bars. They brought my verse in somewhere around six. Mm-hmm. Weird timing. Right. So I get it. I get the need to do so, but I didn't have, if I do a music video, I'm going to approve the final thing. When yeah. I'm watching it as it comes out, mm-hmm. there were certain ways, the, the the structure of how my verse came in, I was like, that's not the beat I chose to come in. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But that being said, our battle was competitive. Mm-hmm. And what people saw also was two people who have mutual respect for each other going against each other. We had off, me and old man Saxon had off camera moments where we were like, Oh, we in our 30s? We the only ones in right, our 30s? Right, 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 right. What's up, bro? You know what right. I'm saying? Had grown man conversations. And so, and we laughed about it prior to the battle. Like, do your shit. I'm like, for sure, you too. And we and we did exactly that. And and in the room, the people was like, whoa, you know. And he won the coin toss. I was like, I go first. That, Leave the pressure on me. You know what I'm saying? Like, he yeah, left man. the pressure on me. But after we battled, what they didn't show is for a 20 minute period, they were like, how do we keep both of them on? Mm. I understand what the rules say. And this is Cardi Chance and Tip. I get the rules. That's keep so them crazy. both. Old it, man Saxon, had the, had it not been written in legal documentation, old man Saxon would have been to the finale. That's very interesting to me mm-hmm. because as a consumer, as an outsider, as a watcher of the show, old man Saxon, we first steps up, you know, I'm a real lyricist. Like, mm-hmm. I consider myself a curator of the culture. Mm-hmm. I don't want to see no fucking games, no novelty rap shit. Right, right, right. So, old man Saxon st- steps up, and immediately I'm looking at it as like a novelty or a gimmick, just the way he presented himself. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, this might be some clown shit. But then he did his thing. He did his one, two thing. And I'm like, I'm watching. And me as a inter, me as a performer, as an entertainer, I just could not front on it. I'm like, not only is he skilled as an MC, but I was highly entertained by, by this act. This old man Saxon act, this character that he came up with, I'm like, that shit's dope. Period. That shit's dope. So I'm watching the show and I'm just entertained and I'm like, how long can he how long can he keep this up? Is he good enough as an MC to keep this up? Now, when y'all battled, to me, that was it was a weird thing because what you said, I'm not a battle rapper. But you're there in the competition. You're there to win, right? You're like, okay, I'm not a battle rapper, but I'm gonna do what I gotta do. Mm. He that character is not designed to be a battle rapper. That caricature that he, he invested in, but he figured out a way to make it into, he created a battle rap perso- persona for that character mm-hmm. to whereas he has some bars where he was getting at you. Getting at me. He was getting he, at you. Oh, uh, wait. What was the one that I was like, you motherfucker. He said, <laughs> he said something about your little sister. Like, ain't that about oh. a bitch? I read your autobiography. Like, ain't that about a bitch? Yeah, that was, yeah, that, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 Bro, I yeah, was in, because I was like, no matter what, game face. So that's my question. I'm, I'm going to show head. you. I'm going to show you right here. Look, look, look. This just says, how necessary was that game face? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It it's was, right there man, I said, no matter what, game face. Mm-hmm. That when game he face. Said, when he said. I thought you wanted to fight the nigga when I seen you. I was watching <laughs> it. I said, oh, he want to fight. My thing was, look, I was like, one, I was like, God, don't let me battle no girl. <laughs> right. Because uh, I knew first and foremost. The one dude battled the girl and he said that rattled him. Yeah. Right oh, before it's tough. You. Yeah. I mean, but Flawless was an example of how to do it. Right. Use the name. Never go after her as a woman. Use the name mm-hmm. and kill the name. Right. And he did it. Right. And Beans is hard. Yeah, she's you know hard. What I'm saying? Super hard. Hard. You know what I'm saying? That um, New York hard. Like, she's hard. Yeah. And it's still hard. You know? Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, flawless. I mean, not Flawless. Uh, old Man Saxon came for me. And, you know, I was like, keep the keep the game face. But when he was like, you know, her, read your biography, like, ain't that about a bitch? <laughs> I was that was mad. a great line. <laughs> but I knew, I knew for a fact that I was like, look, rap in its essence is coming from the streets. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, and signify it's, and it's monkey. Highest, and it's, it's highest form is where the streets meet intellect. That's in right. In its highest form. Because then you have a strategic approach to like, Raising the consciousness of the mm-hmm. streets, which is necessary. 
It's necessary. Like, cause as a teacher, that's what I'm up against. The level of consciousness is so low mm. that people haven't accessed themselves. So I will challenge every motherfucker who like rap to be like, it's our duty. And not at it, not in every song and every line, but at some point, if if it's if just in your interviews, mm -hmm. to start to drop gems on them. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. And I knew if I was, I had already, you know, I'm I'm the type of dude I fight. I sized up everybody there, so mm -hmm. I was like, whoever I battle, as long as it's not a girl, I'm gonna look them in the face and be like, I will beat your ass <laughs> right, right, right. for the sake of what rap is, right. for the sake of who I am, and. To level the playing field because in battles, people say all kind of shit that they never say to another man. Mm -hmm. That's right. With mm -hmm. nobody in between them. You wouldn't look me in my face and say, ain't that about a bitch? You getting mm -hmm. fired on in my city. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So while you say creative shit, because <laughs> I, <could, laughs> I can't control what they say about me. Right. All I can say is like, really? That's my way of saying you wouldn't. You wouldn't say that. I will beat your ass. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and with him going first, it made for more of a moment because it's like, all that sound good. But when we when we take away the cameras, I'll put my hands on. Yeah. But you, you know kept that game face. So you kept it. You, you like you. There was no everyone was having fun. Old Man Sax is Shout funny. Out to Old Man Sax. Yeah, he's funny and all that. <laughs> Everybody laughing the whole time. You stone face. You just uh, the mad dog. Just right the whole time. Mm -hmm. And then you won. Yeah. And as soon as you won. You audibly, Love. you you was like, this is the guy. Mm -hmm. I need to give respect to old man Saxon. Mm -hmm. I need to let you know that I have respect for this man. Mm -hmm. I need to let you know that I I appreciate this man. It was a beautiful thing to see, bro. Absolutely. Yeah. And and the thing is, like I told you, when pops came home, it went from fighting in the streets mm -hmm. to karate and boxing. Mm -hmm. Those things taught me like there's an arena for certain things there's an arena to let this aggressive energy out yeah. battling is that arena to say that shit but then when the gloves come off in the same way that even Tyson Fury said to Deontay Wilder this is a champion he'll be back on the top mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying that's class and that's reality I think people you know I've seen some boxers get out of the get out of a world championship fight win and be like I still don't fuck with this nigga right yeah. whoa bro what did, what you know what I'm saying? Whereas, and if that's the case, speak your truth. You know what I'm saying? Right. But, <laughs> right. but that wasn't the case at all right. with uh, with me and old man Saxon. We literally had, had breakfast. And then he talked shit about your sister. And he <laughs> said, yeah, I mean, but the thing is, and this is why I challenge him. I don't have any sisters. Uh -huh. So, so I was like, Saxon, I hope that wasn't no like already uh, right, right. written verse because yeah. I'm over here like you look like Steve Harvey you right, know what I'm right, saying right. Like, you, come out of you fresh, even got fresh a stash but my flow is the goat T I'm Kobe you no ring Barkley right you know what I'm saying I'm, I'm coming for you and he looked Dude. like both of those people so. you know what I'm saying so I was like I gotta come for him he did the Charles Barkley was my favorite one yeah. <laughs> as a um, comedian uh, as a comedian when you're on stage and you're trying it's a lot of pressure especially when you're trying out a new joke you had to come up with a new uh, song in 48 hours and you forgot your lyrics. How the yeah. hell did you push through and like still have the crowd like jamming with you and you not even singing they the words? They was jamming. You know what? I think I had shocked them already enough to the point where they're like locked into what I was doing, mm -hmm. right? Atomic Dog has been done so many times, but mm -hmm. never the way I did it. Mm -hmm. I was like, it. musically, I was like, I know what we're going to do with this. Mm -hmm. I, because my thing is, I know what they expect out of it. Right, right, right. You know, they think I'm going to be like, that scene in Menace. With my niggas in the right, 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 right. You know, they thought I was going to do that, but I was like, <coughs> you know, why must I feel like that? And then, then cut the beat in half, go halftime. So if it's, if it's at 100 BPM, now we rapping at 50. You know, boom. Incredibly gifted, you know. You can't beat me with a baseball bat. So I knew it was always do something on the show that stops everything and is memorable. So we had done that. I got far enough to where people were like, "What is happening? Where am I right now? Right. I'm in. A, I'm in. I'm in a unique space in this world because this ain't happening nowhere else. Mm -hmm. That's what creativity does. You know yeah. what I'm saying? When you when you listen to Talib records, it's like this is unique. Right, right, right. You know, the rec the radio might put something to the stratosphere it might push something to a huge record 
that doesn't necessarily mean it's unique. Mm -hmm. And that also doesn't give anything longevity. Mm -hmm. It's people deciding right now to put on your projects. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. I'll decide right now to play AT Aliens. Right. You know what I'm saying? So that, that was longevity. Longevity. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, my approach, make it memorable. And I had done that by the time I forgot my lyrics and caught back on. Mm hmm. And fell yeah. back off and caught back up. You right, know right, what I'm right. Like, <laughs> I, that's the irony of it. I was like, fuck, I fucked up twice. You know right. what I'm saying? But, but you y'all create and they they challenging y'all to push yourselves. Yeah. Troy Man said that in the in the last episode. It was like what he said was very important. It's like, man, it's like I d I didn't do anything but grow. Period. Because y'all, I thought I how dope I was. To, I now I'm I'm against all these other artists. Mm -hmm. But the thing I think that pushed you over the top was um what you just spoke about. I knew what I was going to do with Atomic Dog is what you just said to me. Mm -hmm. You know, when you went in for the last song, the finale song, the last supper joint with Soundwave, what I noticed about you that was different and London B and everybody else, they was doing it. I mean, they, they came with they some shit. bangers. They, they, shit. they came with some bangers, mm -hmm. but they went in the studio and to their credit, you know, trusted the producer and created something with the producer. You went in there and be like, yo, this is the tempo. This is what I want you to do. This is, you had the song mapped out in your head because mm -hmm. you, and Soundwave said that when you won, or not, well, not when you won, but after you performed the song, he was like, yo, I've never been in the studio with someone who was as hands-on mm -hmm. as this person. You see him with the guitars, you see him with the keys, and I'm just happy to be a part of it, which is a different type of thing. Um, you really knew what you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that is the blueprint to the success? Yes. I'm, I'm going to say yes because talent, there's no shortage of talent. Mm -hmm. Not at all. And and I think I knew going in that there were other talented people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that it's that vision that carries people through mm -hmm. the hardships that'll knock people off the grind altogether. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So having vision and 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 the vision is knowing what knowing what you want to do and how you want to be represented on there. And that'll make those decisions easy. You know, it made it it made it easy to say this is what I want to do this round. Yeah, and that's what that's where I took the pressure off myself. It's like, all right, look, smoke. Don't worry about winning. Get through this round, and then then you straight, and you'll have another round to get through. Right. You know. So, um, but it was that you know that vision to to of what you what I needed to do to carry on. I feel like everyone did well enough to win on that finale episode. Yes. While you were standing there waiting for the winner announcement, like what was going through your mind? Were you like, oh my God, I might win this shit? Or like, how are you feeling? The first thought was like, either way I did it. Right. Right. Either way I'm standing I'm on that stage here, with them people. I'm here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I heard, like, for example, Troy Man played me some of his music. Incredible. It's cold blooded. The the show can only show you about forty percent of somebody's artistry because yeah. we're restricted by the, you know, the right. terms of that and the challenge. Format. Mm -hmm. Exactly the format. I'm a Troy Man fan. You know what I'm saying. So by that point, we're all fans of each other. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying. So I was proud to have gotten that far. Mm -hmm. One. Um, but after I did my performance and I'm standing there and they're about to say it, I'm all I could help but think, and I'm not gonna lie, all I could help but think, I was like. Man, they had to do something incredible to beat what I did. Right. That's how you felt. Because my thing is, I know that I know that playing and playing keys and rapping was impactful. A lot of people can be impressive. Mm -hmm. Only a select few can be impactful. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Um, I've been impressed by all kind of stuff. I can name easily the people who impacted me mm -hmm. and I, and who the, the artists where I let my guard down and I'm like, I'm going to openly be influenced by how they think. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I think I did that um, with my finale performance. And so there was a point where he was like, when he said the winner is in my head, I'm not going to lie. I said, he about to say D-Small. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, he about to say D-Small. Right. And when he did it, all I wanted to do was take a knee because, you know, I, I, I have faith. You know, I believe in yeah. God, period. Yeah. You know, the music reflect that. Period. I believe in God and um, I believe that God is bigger than any of us have ever been able to articulate, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning, however our religion puts us, he bigger than that. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? But in a time where a lot of times in your life it requires you to have faith, mm -hmm. then other times, you you know, even the Bible is talking about uh, seed, 
time and harvest. Mm -hmm. Harvest is when you start to see the fruit or the uh, or the result of all those things you did, right? Yeah. The success is harvest, you know, in a lot of people's eyes, right? What success is is seeing the result. Yeah. Um, but it's just a special thing when you get to look around you in the world and see like, I'm seeing like mad fruit. I'm seeing things come to pass that I envisioned for years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so throughout the show, long before I won, um, I I started seeing stuff like whoa, and you know I I, I believe like life is a is an ongoing conversation with God, the universe, mm -hmm. however you want to do it. Yeah. And so in, in in my own world, I'm over here like okay, I see you, I see what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, um, when I won, the first thing I wanted to do is like take a knee. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Let me take one knee, take a moment to be thankful. Yeah, and uh, before I got to my knee, my bro, flawless, <laughs> flawless, tackled me, he and was I didn't, on you. I didn't know he what happened. <laughs> I promise you, I was like, "What the f is going Shout on?" Shout out to flawless because he, he love, was, and it was genuine. He was so genuine with the way, genuine, like, bro. and he he told his story and what he did was special on that stage. Mm -hmm. Yes, and how he had London B back when mm -hmm. she was, you know, feeling emotional when she didn't win. He was like, "Hold your head up, baby." Mm -hmm. Yep, and just the way that he. He obviously was there to compete with y'all. Period. But at the same time, he was there to have y'all back. Mm -hmm. And that was something that was very, very visceral with him. It was very, it was very, he, he couldn't contain it in. Mm -hmm. He said it. And when, 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 and right before they announced it, he, he took a moment to be like, he said, he smoked. He looked at you. Smoke. It's love. We hear. We, you know what I'm saying? And I've it's, seen it's all just that. that mutual respect, right? I, I, I ain't even front, bro. I had a, uh, cause I told you I'm not a battle rapper. Mm hmm. I was like TGI DBF. Mm. Thank God I didn't battle flawless. Right, because <laughs> he built for that. Yeah. What you mean? What you mean yeah. that boy built like that? You yeah. know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's certain arenas you don't want to put nobody in with me because mm -hmm. I'm made like that. Mm -hmm. Right. If it comes to co-producing with a dope producer, like not only I could produce it by myself, mm -hmm. but you put me in with somebody that's a monster, like we gonna come up with something crazy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like that's my arena. So I use my advantages, but you know, everybody has their, their strengths and whatnot. So it just happened to place my advantage. Like I said, I wasn't there to win. I was there to represent. That's right. You know, and so that to get to that difference. point, to get to that point, it's like, man, I look over, it's mutual respect. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. the, the, what people don't know is that that six or seven weeks was like a roller coaster, right? And so to be there being like, Either way, whatever they decide, the work is done. Mm -hmm. That's a whole different type of respect because it's like, bro, well, we did it. Right. <laughs> Either way. Right. Did we did it already. It's done. You know? Did they have you guys staying like in a hotel room or yes. together the whole time? Yes. <laughs> Mind you. Other <laughs> niggas' bathroom habits and all that. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Okay. We're in our own oh, hotel. Okay, okay, We're in okay. the same hotel. Okay. No, it ain't no, it ain't a dorm. You know right, what I'm right. But no, it's um I'm in I'm from Inglewood. Right. We're in Hollywood. He was home. I got my car. Yeah. They're like, don't leave. Mm. I'm really like, hey, look, man. <laughs> Y'all usually don't get started till about five or something. Mm -hmm. Call time to the lobby be like seven. Hurry up and wait. Hurry up and wait. Come to the lobby at seven. We get to set by 745. Hair and makeup done. Uh, hair and makeup wardrobe done by 945. Mm -hmm. And they're probably filming at three. But they're going to turn the cameras on when you're waiting to because they want some footage of what, yeah, your, yeah, what yeah. your pre process is. Yeah. That's the part that that messes with an artist's mind, too, because it's, it's two different worlds colliding. Mm -hmm. Reality TV world is, it has a different set of rules than I'm going to go perform or I'm going to write a song or I'm going to go in the studio. Those are very private things that we don't yeah. get to. Our artists would, if they had a choice, they would choose not to let the world see because you want them to see the product. And if you give them the process, you giving it give it to them on your terms, not on your terms, on your terms. Yeah, that must have been hard mm. for you, you know, because you've already you already doing this. Um, mm. You know, like 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 for instance, like Black Habits. You know, you I know you dropped Inglewood High. I feel like Ingle, Inglewood High was a a response to your newfound fame yes. and Black Habits. You've been working on for a minute. Exactly. Um, you spoke about your relationship with God just now. Mm -hmm. You go hard talking about your relationship with God on Black Habits. Mm -hmm. It's super pro black. Mm -hmm. super spiritual um how long did it take you to work on that project the oldest song on black habits is closer to god mm -hmm. 
And that song um, is now four years old, mm. you know. And then then you have songs like Free, which is two years old. And you have Bullies, which is two years old. Um, you have Gasparianga, which is three months old. Mm. You got Real Body, which is two months old. Right. Like, so this is a, a, almost like a lifetime in the making exactly, of this project. Exactly. So it was... I wanted it to be a certain degree of storytelling because again, the projects that I feel, I want my goal in music, like it's not to just, I do see myself like, I'm smart enough to be like, we gonna win. Mm -hmm. Whatever that looks like, we gonna do all of that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But we're not gonna leave here without doing certain stuff. We're not gonna leave here without telling stories, without inspiring, without teaching, you mm -hmm. know, in the music. So, um, and, and we wanted to do a lot of that the first go around because I feel like that's the root of it all. And then you can go anywhere from there. Yeah. You know, so, um, but it, it did take time. Mm -hmm. It did take time. And, and you know, like I, I said, I tell people, you know, extend your runway. Extend your runway. That's that's the theme for this interview. Extend you've your said, runway. You've said that several times. And, um, you know, it's like the same thing that Nip said. It's a marathon, mm -hmm. you know? It's like, you know, to, uh, new Black Star, you know, the concept we're dealing with, me and most work on this new album is the concept of the album is no fear of time. It's like, don't, don't worry about, you know what I'm saying? The time is. Chance said it too. Yeah. Chance. You got time to make mistakes. Yeah. You, Will, how liberating Will Smith is on that? His, Will Smith on his Instagram did a whole thing about why you have to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know exactly what his, I can't quote what he said, but go to Will Smith's in, Instagram. And you go see it. Vin Diesel said the same thing to me at Tyrese's house. My brothers mm -hmm. work closely with Tyrese, writing mm -hmm. for him on his Black Rose project. Always oh. Coca Cola. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> on the back of the bus. <laughs> but, uh, Shout out to Tyrese. Yes. But uh, Vin Diesel was like, the most liberating thing he ever heard was like, you're supposed to and should make mistakes. Yeah. And was like, he was like, <laughs> he was like, when I found out how, I was like, what? Oh, I'm good at that. Right, <laughs> you know what I'm right. saying? Like, I'm on my way. Boiler room, pitch black. I'm, a bunch mm -hmm. of... <laughs> that's what stops a lot I'm a Vin Diesel fan. That's why I'm, I know these references. Yeah. That's what stops a lot of people from trying because mm -hmm. they feel like, oh, it's not going to be perfect or, oh, it's not going to be what I envisioned. But if you don't put it out there, then you're not going to know how to make it ever get it to that ending route. Let's talk about the song Bullies for a second. Bullies. Um, you as a teacher... Mm -hmm. You said you had to break up a fight once. You got punched in the face. Blast. By a girl. By a girl. She hit like a grown man. Because girls can be bullies too. What is no, the she hit. In the face? No, she hit like a girl. <laughs> oh, she hit like a girl. She hit like we, we, we woke up. Because she hit yeah. just like herself. Right. She hit like that herself. That was a girl hit. And it was <laughs> right. a she powerful like a um, Right. I feel it. As a teacher, as someone who made a song called Bullies, as someone who's like, I stand up to, to a bully, mm -hmm. is cyberbullying real? Um, Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And- it's it's a uh, words are more powerful. Like if mm -hmm. I if I beat somebody up, they recover. Mm -hmm. They might have to deal with the little traumas of it. But if I if I say something to somebody mm -hmm. that aligns with the fear that they have about themselves, then they have to restructure their own view of themselves, mm -hmm. which is way more work than putting a band aid on a wound. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's like cyberbullying is like. You start attacking at somebody's character or attacking at mm -hmm. their image of themselves or how people view them, which is going to shape how they view themselves because, you know, they're fighting against this this image of what what people are saying about them. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's super real. And um, and I think it's just a whole lot of cowardice activity mm -hmm. because cyberbullying, you can't immediately reap the consequences of your actions. So from a distance, everybody, what what uh, Drake said, Twitter fingers turn to trigger fingers. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Everybody bold right here or mm -hmm. right here. Whereas like here, you know, you have to think about it. Mm -hmm. You know, so people, um, I don't know if people in society know how cutthroat they've become. Yeah. And I, 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 I like to challenge cancel culture. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, humans are the only species on this earth that pay for something over and over again. Mm -hmm. Right. When you say you're going to cancel somebody from the culture, you're basically saying you can't recover from this error in your ways and your mm -hmm. actions and your perspective, which is innately not true. That's right. We change, grow and progress, develop as humans, as people, as 
organisms, everything changes, yeah. changes constant. So by saying like, I want to cancel you, you know, I I wore uh I wore a black pyramid at a show. It was a it was a the TDE um the TDE community event during Christmas. To 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 enter it, they had to give you a you had to donate a toy, mm -hmm. and they given toys to all the uh, kids in the projects. Then the next day, they bring snow to the hood. You mm -hmm. know, beautifulest thing ever. They asked me to perform, and I wear something because they reached out to me and gave me a package and I wear it and some people are like why are you wearing that do you identify with women beaters I'm like so to put an ER on this man's image right that's something that you, you've you've put yourself in a position of judge and juror and and you've decided that you only be happy when he can no longer survive mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying this is a mob mentality of like hang him scarlet letter this person yeah you yeah. know what i'm saying and so cancel culture is something that i'm super vocal about because it's like no you don't want that for yourself mm -hmm. you don't want right. your mistake to become an er on your name right you cheated you're a cheater right. permanently right you you the people who shout that the loudest never put themselves under that microscope under that and microscope. will never be under that microscope under that microscope mm -hmm. so that um that's that's something i'm, I'm super vocal about I'm not even sure how we got there. No, I, I think, I think, I think you were right. I think you were right to take it there when you, mm -hmm. you know, what were you about to say? Well, since you're already there, you know, it's a lot of celebrities these days that are having to take themselves off of Instagram because of cyberbullying and yeah. having to, um, you know, take care of their mental health first. What do you think about? Um, how how do you how do you plan on dealing with that? If like you know. Or how do you deal with cyberbullies when they come at you for different things? I, I have opinions on everything, right? Mm -hmm. But I only speak on what's real to me. Because when I lay my head down at night, I'm going to be like, you know, I spoke from an informed place. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I can I can have opinions from a completely uninformed place, but I'm not going to put them in this interview. Reason being, it's not my experience. I know my experience like the back of my hand, Right. But for somebody else's, I may have an opinion on it, but I'm not going to speak on it because it's not mine to critique, mm -hmm. not not publicly. So if I'm like I can deal with it, if they if they coming at me for something I'm saying about me, I'm my only response is you don't know <laughs> mm -hmm. where I come from. Like I do, at least you might have another experience close to it. You can't tell me anything about where I come from and I can stand on that. Now, if it's backlash for something that I spoke out of place, then I I just retract my statement. You know what? That ain't that ain't my experience to speak on. But right. I probably won't have to do that because yeah, I'm not going. I'm not going to speak not about what I don't know. It's, it's not mine. Right. I don't know it firsthand. For example, you know my cousin Tiffany Goucher, mm -hmm. one of the loves of my life. The first I'm all brothers, so the first girl that's close like my own sister, you know, is Tiffany Goucher. Mm -hmm. You know, she's a masculine presenting lesbian woman. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And <laughs> let her tell it. She was like, I want it to be like y'all. <laughs> and I'm like, for right, sure. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? We've always embraced her that way. You know, but she speaks to things that I allow her to speak to in a way that I don't address. Mm -hmm. But mm. what I will do is like, as her big cousin, if you got a problem with her, yeah, guess probably. who you got a problem with? That's right. Me, period. And now I don't know the details of it that she does. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna let her speak, and I'm gonna make sure that you listen when she does. That's right. And that's that's as far as I can go with it. Right. I, I can't go and be like the LGBT community can. Right. Uh, that's not mine. Right. You understand I, that? But I, I respect anybody's right to speak their truth, and and ride for it. That's right. So that's, that's that. right. Um, we had the game on this show. Hey. And he go. spoke your praises, and he talked about. Being excited to work with you. Yes. Talk to me about working with a West Coast legend like the game. You know what? I, I've I've noticed a common thread around legends. Mm -hmm. Right? Legends are so centered in their energy and their experience that they have a way. And this is Snoop game. They have a way of talking to you and addressing you as if nobody's there. Mm -hmm. I've never got more respect. Then from you know Game and Snoop like those are my West Coast and I've worked with Dre and Dre show me love mm -hmm. you know but Dre put me on the hot seat like let's see what you got nephew right you know what I'm saying whereas um 
I didn't have anything necessarily to prove after Snoop pressed me. I didn't have nothing to prove with Snoop or nothing to prove with Gang. Mm -hmm. Gang was like, man, I see you. Mm -hmm. I saw what happened. Gang was the first person to reach out after the show to be like, now let me take you from this TV world mm. into this rap world. Cause it's He's very serious about this rap shit. What? Game love rap. Game is built for it. That's he love rap. Him. I love the rap. Mm. What? Born to rap. Born to rap. Born to rap. And, and I'm talking about, and he's competitive too. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So That's the way in which he brought you up. Exactly. As a competitor, but out of love. Yes, it was friendly. And, and, and I'm... I'm familiar with that world. I got brothers, so it's that love plus com competition. That's how you grow. Mm -hmm. Iron sharpens iron. So he, that's why he told me go first. And but, you know, to keep it one hundred, the 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 song that we did, that's on this project, wasn't the first song that happened that night. Mm -hmm. I worked on something else. I had another idea we played around with for about an hour and a half, and it didn't materialize. Mind you, it's thirty people in the room mm -hmm. when. The idea that I had at first didn't come to something that I liked. Mm -hmm. I was trying and uh, and it didn't happen. And then some people left, you know, and when it got down to about seven people, game went in and did a hook. They put on another beat like, hey, man, let's try something else. And I'm quick to do that. Like, hey, this ain't going there. Pull up something else because there's another beat that's going to expire that we'll just charge that to the warm up energy mm -hmm. and we'll go back in. He does a hook. They put a cross on Jesus back. Mm, uh, you know what I'm saying and mind you he played me the whole project before we started mm -hmm. getting in which I appreciate and that's a veteran move because I can easily go in here and be like this is what I want to do and he'd be like I'm recreating the energy that's already in the project whereas if he plays me everything then it's like okay what can I do that's not there right you know and I think that's art right what can I do that's not there Right. You know, what, how do? What's my? How? What can I add? Like, what's exactly? Yeah. Otherwise, it's not a contribution. Mm -hmm. You know. So he played me the whole project, which I think was smart because it's like, all right, I know. I, I'm on the way there. I'm, I like to be prepared. So on the way there, I'm like, game project. I'm gonna go in there and be like Inglewood to Compton and this and that. And, yeah. And right. What's funny is it ended up happening anyway, but more in his verse. Mine was more me being me. You know, and he did the hook that allowed me to to find that zone and that, you know, um, how many people endure that judgment? You know, mom, mm. you know, when it comes, it comes, bro. Mm. Like my mom is a songwriter and she said her best stuff. Um, she can look back and not figure out like how it actually came. It came easy. Yeah. It wasn't a labor. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And this songs Black Habits, too. Like. I looked up and, and and I did that at my last teaching job. That was also a unique opportunity to make songs. And I did Black Habits there on my job. But it was one of those songs where it's like, um, when I look up and when the verse is done, I'm like, how did that come together? Yeah. You know, it's not like I had to labor to try to find those lines. They come to you and you yeah. just, it's damn near like you sit back and you're grateful. Like, thanks. I, I don't know how that came together. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like especially the 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 second the the second verse on Black Habits Part Two, you know, cinnamon colored citizens get the bitter end of the stick every damn time. Plenty young in the penitentiary filling up and they didn't do the damn crime. Mm -hmm. Simeon didn't lit a C twenty five. He took a stride and hit a landmine. Had everything money can't buy. Stuck in the box like a pan mine. You know what I'm saying? Just like stuff that's like so true to my experience, but so true to my experience both personally and a and in my community, in my circle of friends, you know, so, but yeah, I just, I just felt fortunate that that came together because, and that was how I mm -hmm. felt on the game session. Like it, once it made sense, it just flowed, you know? Well, for someone who started rapping late, you caught up quick. Mm -hmm. um, Seemingly. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to ask one more thing about Kobe Bryant. Mm. Cause we recently lost this giant and this icon. Um, he was hugely significant in the landscape, not just, of basketball and sports iconoclast, but in terms of the city of Los Angeles, and as someone who's here, mm -hmm. can for people who don't get it, who people who weren't here, can you break down what Kobe means to the city? Um, I'm gonna say I I can't. Okay. Right? We're gonna start there. Everything I anything I do to try to sum up what Kobe means to us is gonna fall short. Okay. That being said, um, He's woven into our daily lives. Mm -hmm. So, one, it hits you personally first. Like, 
Kobe, what he meant to me, right? And then you're like, oh my God, this is my hero, this is this. So you experience it once. Then you talk to somebody and then something else comes to mind where it's like, dang, we have this memory around this person. You know, everything, with it's like, that's somebody you follow mm-hmm. off the court. You follow this person, like, you know what I'm saying? F- to the Kanye commercial, mm-hmm. like, <laughs> what do you mean Kobe Bryant? Yeah. You know, more, you know? And it's it's so true to who he was and it's our real life hero that we lost. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the thing that, I forget who said it, the one thing we learned about Kobe in his death that we never knew is that he's actually human that's right Mm. we didn't view him that way that's right we didn't we did put him on that pedestal and it's unfair to him but the cold part is the level of greatness that he had achieved and the the level of character that he had is like he wanted to meet that standard which is unfair to anybody keeping 100 Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying nobody want to be that far where it's like how people view you is way above what's humanly possible Mm. and somehow you Mm. you stand up to that you know what I'm saying? And so not only that, we watched him grow. He he was a kid, came into the NBA before he could buy, long before he could buy liquor. Right. You know what I'm saying? And we saw him fail, which makes it only makes it sweeter that we see him win. Right. You know? And so it That's just the humanizing us, part. Yes. It taught us so much because it's like, oh, you airballed the threes you know your first year but you also took that shot which says so much about how how brave you were you know what i'm saying and you didn't not shoot it again you airballed three times in one game Mm. and then the third time you you still was with it you know what i'm saying and then later like you know how how symbolic that was for like i shot my air balls Mm -hmm. you know all three of them and more me too you know i shot my air balls bro i earned it and that's i think that's the part people don't see and i I appreciate your intro because you said overnight success is the is the misnomer that's what people think Mm -hmm. and it's anything but that so it it was just we grew up with him we grew up with him we was on crenshaw when they won when they won the first championship Mm -hmm. and that's it and people what people don't know is you have bloods and crips out on crenshaw all oh, talk about Lakers, right? <laughs> like it's people like, don't even talk about. They don't. That's, they that's don't realize it. They don't know yeah. we're on Crenshaw, going from Manchester and Crenshaw to King through hoods, and it's not a red or blue flag, and not that they not there, but it's the Lakers. It's the Lakers, and it's it's so the power of inspiration and the power of symbolism to youngsters. You know, from a teacher's perspective, it is is limitless and he was that you know what i'm saying and is that you know now it's just he's immortalized early mm. you know what i'm saying so um we could talk forever about that but man i i i shed additional tears when my nephew called me mm. yeah because he looks to me he i'm his tangible hero um so it's like he needed to hear my voice because it's like kobe's the intangible and we share that That's in common, right. but you're my tangible hero. Like, hey, talk to me real quick. Yeah. Just so I know you still there. You know? Same thing with my son. My son played basketball in high school and I did, I'm not into basketball. I don't, you know, I'm not into it like that at all. Mm-hmm. I know pop culture. I know what Kobe meant to the culture. Yes. But I didn't, you know, I don't know the stats. You know what I'm saying? My son mm-hmm. played basketball and like, I spoke to him and I was like, yo, how you feeling? What's up? I just call him. What's up? He's like, man, it's Kobe shit. I'm like. Oh, I didn't even, you know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't even realize on that level, on the basketball level, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But word up, man. Yeah. Um, Man, D Smoke, man. Party people. Yes. People's party. Libra game. Talib. Talib. Talib Kwali. Yes, sir. Right.